Hello, everyone. Let's get started. Let's get started. <laughs> Otherwise, we would never start. <laughs> um, so, yeah, please find your seats and we can start the day. Come on, come on. There's room. I see people are still getting ready for the day, still drinking their first coffees and uh, chatting. That's nice. This conference means to um, connect people, to make you talk, to make you discuss, um, to... But welcome everyone to the second day of the EduWiki conference 2023 in Belgrade, Serbia. Um, Welcome to people that have come, uh, that have arrived here in the meantime. Um, it was, it's nice to have you here. Um, we were sad that you weren't here yesterday, but that's fine. Um, I hope you all had some good night's sleep. Um, I know it's hard at conferences um, to have your like regular quota of sleep, but um, it's still really important to function properly during the whole day because we do have, uh, a bunch of program prepared, thanks to Liana and the program team. Um, so, and I hope you had a, a fruitful day yesterday uh, with the program and with uh, personal interconnections and, and discussions. So, um, and I hope you had a good night, uh, like evening maybe. Um, so, yeah, today's program is going to be great. So, please stick around for sessions. We still have three rooms. This one, atrium. Forum, which is over there, and Belgrade. I know a lot of people asked about Belgrade. It's right next to the reception, right to the right of the reception. Um, so yeah, um, I would also want to remind you that Trust and Safety team is still here. That's still Sukaina, Silesh, and me. And if you have any problems, troubles, whatever, please feel free to contact us. So that's about it for me. Uh, I'm. Uh, even I'll take it over for other housekeeping stuff. Good morning. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, give you a couple of reminders. Um, I've sent uh, streaming links uh, uh, via mailing list uh, so you can share it with uh, people who are um, interested in listening uh, to the sessions. Um, I'll just remind uh, to uh, people who weren't here yesterday that uh, only sessions in Atrium and Forum are recorded, um, not sessions in Belgrade Room. Um, so. I'll also uh, send this link, uh, these links uh, to the Telegram group. Um, on the, uh, we also have some information regarding the group photo. Uh, we will have the group photo after the first session, so at 10.15. Uh, uh, and we will do it in the backyard uh, of the restaurant. You can go to the backyard um, through the restaurant. So uh, we will guide you, don't worry. So uh, we will have uh, the group photo there if it's not rainy. Uh, but uh, if we do have rain, then we will do it in front of this room, atrium room. Uh, and uh, one more important thing is the city tour tonight. Um, I've sent some details via mailing list, but I'll repeat it now, and you will have these details um, during the day, sent during the day. Um, we will have um, a city tour starting at 6 p.m. in front of the hotel, uh, two buses, uh, and please don't be late uh, because we have to start then. Um, uh, the bus route of the tour will be slightly adapted due, due to the protest, uh, but you'll get to see some of the nice places in Belgrade during that tour. Uh, and then we go to Kalemegdan Fortress. Um, you'll walk through the fortress, you'll see um, other side of the Belgrade um, uh, wh while walking, and you'll have the tour guide, really interesting tour guide. Uh, after that, um, you'll go to Skadarlia, um, restaurant Tri Shashira, Three Hats on English, uh, and um, you can also ask volunteers for a location if you're coming directly to the restaurant. So you don't have to go to the tour if you want to have some rest here in the hotel. You can just join us um, at the dinner at um, 8.30. Um, all of these details, as I said, will be sent uh, via mailing list during the day. So um, I'm going to 
give the word to Philip again and uh, please have a nice day today and uh, enjoy today's sessions. Thank you. Um, thanks, Ivana. So now we have the first plenary session, which is actually a panel discussion uh, that will be led by Yop Rang Pam. And um, yeah, it's a panel discussion uh, with education program leaders from around the world uh, who will um, share their perspectives on the global, um, on the, on the education system and education and Wikipedia and Wikimedia all together. So uh, a huge round of applause for y'all. Um, morning everyone and it's such a pleasure for me to be here. It's, um, this is my first education conference um, and just to introduce myself, I'm yes, Yoprang Pam, senior strategist uh, with the Wikimedia Foundation. A lot of the work that I do is focused on movement strategy and supporting our team, our communities and different teams to achieve their strategy, visions, missions and goals. Um, a little about myself. When I was younger, I started out in media and then, you know, transitioned in my career. And one of the things that I really enjoyed doing um, at the start of my career or start of, you know, my work in, um, in development is, was education. Um, I took on, at that time, this powerful governor who had a focus on education but was just playing lip service. But from there, you know, it sort of just really sparked my interest and my love and my passion for education. I have two kids. One of them is in tertiary and one of them is, is at primary stage. Their education matters. I come from a country where education just complete, has been decimated. So being here is personal on a lot of levels but also very exciting because this is my first wiki education conference and technically my first wikimedia conference outside of the shores of africa <laughs> so thank you i'll i'll be very excited i'll say don't mind my excitement just take it as all part of uh the session today um I'd like to introduce our panelists who will be sit seated here. What we'll, have, what we'll be discussing um, on the panel today is, uh, what will happen on the panel today is really a discussion. It's a conversation. Um, there are journeys that people take and something has to spur that journey. Something takes us on that path. And we're hoping that the panel conversation today takes us on that path, that we begin to ruminate, begin to think, begin to explore um, all the beautiful things that can happen globally in education, our role in that space, um, and how we can take the charge and lead. Um, I'd like to invite the panelists, Joao from Brazil. Uh, our panelists will introduce themselves better, but y'all, please. <laughs> um, Bukola from Nigeria, please take a seat. Yay. Uh, Rami from... Yeah, oh, we have two Ramis, but yes, please both come <laughs> Rami from Indonesia and from Morocco, please come up. <laughs> and then we, we have Frank, Frank who's uh, from the US. All right, so we have a big panel, lots Okay, yes. all right, um, right. So the movement strategy process began way back, 2016, 2017. I'm not going to go into too much of the details, but we can share some more afterwards. But that process set our movement on the path for a shared goal towards 2030. We aligned on a set of principles that need to drive our free knowledge or open knowledge movement, depending on who you're talking to, uh, and the principles of knowledge equity, that is that all might have access and knowledge as a service, that all might receive knowledge. A set of 10 recommendations and 47 initiatives now drive this work and our collective advancement towards um, achieving these goals towards 2030. 
Now, what better demonstration of these principles of equity and service than the education ecosystem? However, what is this ecosystem? Um, within this ecosystem, how aware are we of the different actors, different players, different programs, of the different pieces and how they fit, how interconnected or not are we? Uh, what priorities continue to drive our work? What types of passions and visions push us every day to continue to do this work? So in keeping with the principles of movement strategy, what might be the most interesting ways that education could advance within our movement? Who we are on this journey, who are we on this journey with? And what is that North Star that we keep looking towards? We may not have it yet, but is it important to begin to have those conversations? How might we envision our futures collectively and still continue along our different paths? As education is perhaps the most established and structured piece of the free knowledge movement, would I be wrong in saying that? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, so as it is perhaps the most structured piece of our free knowledge movement currently, our panel discussion today is crucial as they will be discussing the futures that we could envision and the ways we could do that from our different parts of the world. We'll try to envision this um, and the budding innovation pieces. We'll try to recognize the people that we should make sure to carry al along on this journey and how we work towards our shared vision on education. So to our panelists, I'll give you two minutes just to get us started and um, thinking about a few things. I have one question. Um, I'm excited. I've told you why I'm excited to be here, but I'd like to hear from each of our panelists, starting from you, Rami. That's okay. Um, what are you most excited about in terms of education? Um, and why do you think that this work is important? Two minutes, starting with you. Yeah. Brahim, sorry. Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Brahim Faraji from uh, Morocco, um, coordinator of uh, education program with the uh, user group. So uh, the first thing, if we start, imagine that every children uh, have skills and have this, uh, how we can say that, the skill that he know how he look for information, how he can evaluate, evaluate uh, sources, and how he will produce information. So then I think that will change every nation. So education start uh, from the beginning, from schools. So if we want uh, to talk about development of any nation, we should talk about education. So uh, every program and uh, like we did uh, with education team at the foundation, uh, with the program uh, Reading Wikipedia and Classroom, uh, give us a uh, great idea about the impact uh, that we can have uh, through the project, through Wikipedia to develop the nation. So, uh, yeah, we are super glad and super excited to continue uh, uh, to develop uh, education through Wikipedia inside class, uh, classroom and uh, with teachers, especially. Thank you very much, Brahim. Rami. Um, thank you very much. So, hey everyone, my name is Rahmi or Amy, if you uh, know me as Amy. Um, so, I started to join as a volunteer in 2016. And then, um, because I started to get more active, uh, especially as a member of Wikimedia Indonesia, in 2018, I was uh, given a responsibility by Wikimedia Indonesia to uh, hold a project called Wiki Goes to School, and that's for Japanese Wikipedia. And from the conversations with the lecturers of the university that um, we were, um, that uh, were our targets at the time, um, it was really, um, for them, it was really amazing that they eventually can teach um, local language with 
a platform that they never thought about before. They never even knew that there were local language Wikipedia uh, and that they could uh, make use of it as, um, as a platform that the students can use, that uh, they can use to teach and uh, something like that. So, um, yeah, with the help of the volunteers, the project went well and then I'm just excited to see uh, where the education project will take us and also like the volunteers to, uh, you know, to, to create a, a space where everything can be accessible and everything can be available and uh, people just can, as Rhyme said, uh, can have like the skill to access uh, the information uh, and content um, easily because um, I think uh, that is uh, one of the most vital skills that uh, people should uh, look for, especially now. So yeah, I'm just uh, really excited to see where the education uh, program will take us and also how it will be able to also grow the community, um, especially within the movement. Thank Fantastic. you very much. Thank you. Bukola? Okay. Um. Good morning, and my name is Bukola James, and I'm from Nigeria. I'm a certified trainer of the Reading Wikipedia in the classroom, and also a community coordinator for Code for Africa. So uh, what I'm most excited about Wikipedia education is that uh, the power that it holds to promote learning and information dissemination in a, in a large scale and also, something that excites me more about Wikipedia and education is the power it's all, it holds to uh, address the challenges of misinformation, disinformation, and missing information that we also have in the, in the um, online spaces. So these are some of the things that excite me more about Wikipedia plus education. And I feel it's something that everybody here should be excited about. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Joao? Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Joao. Uh, I'm from Brazil. So what I'm more look at the North Star. In <laughs> Brazil, we look at the South Cross. Ah. So we have a different guiding star, awesome. but at the same uh, in the same way, we are building together a constellation. Mm. So it doesn't really matter the star you are looking at, if it's in the north or the south, uh, to look at open knowledge, and I was talking uh, in the morning with Frank and Leanne about it, is uh, our compass point. I'm also very excited because when we look at becoming a community, in, it means that we are uh, getting serious about having a collective effect and a collective impact. So when I started uh, in education back in 2011 in a program led by Liana, <laughs> uh, interestingly, um, I didn't really understand that there was a movement behind it. Mm -hmm. And I think to some extent the, the Wikimedia and education movement is possibly one of the strongest and one of the most uh, uh, capable parts of our movement to actually lead us to uh, so a different uh, quality of future. So I'm very excited about this. Awesome. Thank you. Frank. Good morning. Um, my name is Frank Schulenburg. I'm originally from Germany, now living in California. And um, I feel very fortunate that um, I can work um, at the intersection of education and Wikipedia. And um, the reason for that is goes back to my family background. Uh, neither of my parents um, graduated from high school, and um, yet at the same time, they knew that education was a thing that would uh, benefit you and uh, would be the solution for you having a better life. And so um, I think that um, the power of what we're, what we're doing here fascinates me every, every single day. And um, I'm most fascinated by the impact that we can have. Because on the one hand, we can um, 
provide people through Wikipedia with free access to knowledge, no matter whether your parents are rich or poor. And then at the same time, um, we can provide students and other people with a better learning experience, uh, bringing Wikipedia and education together. And I think that's incredibly powerful and I'm super happy to be here today. Thank you very much. Please put your hands together for our panelists. They've shared some personal details. All right, so I'll, I'll work backwards uh, now, but this is really a conversation again. Um, but this is just a question to get us thinking. I'd like to, like to um, sort of hear how we discuss this. Okay, all right. We'll call out what's happening in Nigeria and other parts of Africa. Okay, um, so like what my um, colleagues have said, the panel, my co-panelists have said, um, generative AI has come to stay and so uh, in um, several innovations that are also um, part of the emerging trends that we now see every day. And um, from the context of Africa, the global south, we see how a, uh, so many issues to deal with in terms of uh, um, on, um, unstable internet connectivity and uh, so many other challenges that we face because we are from the global south. But that doesn't really stop the fact that generative AI has come to stay. And um, what, what I see Wikipedia Plus Education doing is trying to change, uh, is trying to help people better understand how to make effective use of this generative AI. Uh, some couple of days ago, I saw on Telegram Wikimedia AI. I don't know if anyone has also seen that. And I think it's a new idea that uh, they want to use to help people um, get a, a kind of a summary out of existing Wikipedia article. And I, and I think it's a very good one because rather than uh, people making use of chat, uh, chat GPT to extract content from different um, online sources, then uh, if we have the wiki, uh, Wikimedia AI, then it would help like um, help people get meaningful and reliable content, even if it's like a generative AI, but then we believe that it's uh, going to help people retrieve verifiable and reliable information. So uh, generative AI has come to stay, but then we can always help people better make good use of this generative AI by yeah. coming up with innovations. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, I think. Perfect. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, I think the world is changing very fast. Um, mm -hmm. For As for Indonesia, uh, before the pandemic, um, I think that there were not like that uh, many teachers were aware that um, education materials can be have in a, like, uh, we can have like education materials in digital uh, forms. And then the pandemic happened and then suddenly we are here with generative AI. Um, and it's just like it, it threatens um, uh, everything. And I had a, I had a uh, question um, from from a teacher. Then how um, how how are we going to deal with it? Um, and uh, especially with what we're doing with Wikipedia and everything. And I think. Um, yeah, at that at that time, I couldn't really answer because it was a it was it was a new thing for me. It was like a new technology for me. But it was a question that that was ri raised, and it was one of the thing that also uh, became uh, the focus of like, uh, especially Wikimedia Indonesia to tackle uh, in the upcoming years. But I think, uh, as uh, what Fukula said, like we're here to also. Um, like even though there are a machine learning and everything, but I think there is nothing that can uh, beat the power of like human minds. Mm -hmm. So um, we're here to provide that that side of uh, to just like to balance to balance it, um, especially uh, coming to uh, educational institutions to to educate uh, the way Wikimedia projects work and um, to provide. 
uh, contents that are actually used by the generative AIs to uh, to provide um, the information. Right. So um, yeah, uh, the work that we we are doing here is I think is very important in that terms. Uh -huh. um, and as teachers in Indonesia now are more aware of the use of uh, digital platforms, uh, we also understand why they start to uh, be more concerned about about these uh, these generative AIs and um, what's the future will be like for for the students. Right. So um, yeah, I think we're here to educate on that part. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, for me, uh, I'm super happy that. Uh, listening uh, to uh, those uh, innovative ideas uh, but at the same time I'm, I feel so sad because there is uh, many levels of the risk for example in Morocco we still working we should take consideration uh, many type of countries and the infrastructure of and the system of each country for example in Morocco we still working with paper so uh, not with emails. So if you contact, for example, government for partnership, it will be not the same in Europe or in US. Uh, that if we talk about the system. Uh, the infrastructure is not the same. For example, in Africa, it's not the same in Europe or US. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The sound of Let's different countries. <laughs> yeah. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the James Bond of education. <laughs> uh, so, as I said, there is many level of rhythm or many fields that we should uh, take in consideration. So, uh, how it works in each uh, country what is the infrastructure in each country mm -hmm. and the perception for us, for example, in Morocco, the big challenge that we face it is the perception to Wikipedia. So that is for us is the most hard uh, challenge that we, if we face it, especially with uh, teachers and government. All right. So uh, uh, our wish or our dream is uh, that we can have support uh, or we can work together uh, to give Wikipedia a big place in TV and media uh, that people uh, push people to know uh, more about Wikipedia and the value of the movement and uh, the way that we can exploit, uh, use Wikipedia to develop our education and our nation. So right. I think the first thing for us in Morocco is working on the perception. Hmm. So if everyone, uh, if we can correct this per perception, so everyone will uh, be motivated to work with us and help us uh, to uh, develop many tools uh, to raise education uh, in Morocco or in Africa or Arab world. Because right. I think Morocco is uh, small simple of the country, uh, Arab country and Africa. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we, we've talked a lot about some of the external factors that would affect education, how we see them, technology, um, generative AI and the likes. But I'm curious, from the different regions that we're coming, uh, coming from, what innovations are happening, education on the wiki, that could influence the globe? Uh, I had a really interesting conversation yesterday about a, a project um, sort of spurred by uh, the work of um, UNICEF and UNESCO, um, data, the wiki data, sorry, I, I'm not too conversant with the details, but wiki data and sort of having this curriculum that helps you, having a curriculum set where you can search and find out, you know, what country's using what curriculum, what does it mean, and things like that. So on wikis, uh, you know, within our different regions, what innovative things are happening? What is new that can change the world? What is new or budding that people probably are not aware of but could learn from 
that could that could be game changers essentially. And I I, I see y'all you're nodding and Rami as well. So please tell us tell us what's going on. What do we need to learn? Okay, yeah. So I've been nodding because yes, there's this um, project that is um, currently ongoing, and um, the project was um, um, was facilitated by Kiwis. Now, uh, because Africa is always having to deal with uh, the problem of um, internet, unstable internet connectivity, and then uh, getting data to like edit on Wikipedia is always uh, always very expensive for some people who cannot afford to get uh, data, right? And right. then as organizers, we also have to deal with uh, providing uh, um, data support for uh, editors who are willing to edit or for teachers who want to be part of the Wikimedia community. But then the idea of using Kiwix, which is an offline, uh, an offline uh, website that help people have free access to Wikipedia, was uh, one of the uh, the big uh, projects that is currently ongoing. And um, this project was also like um, facilitated by Open Foundation West Africa. Mm. Now this project is big to us because uh, it's a new way for students to have free access to Wikipedia. Because um, even though we had like certified some teachers through the reading Wikipedia in the classroom program, some of them um, wanted to like do a step down training or like organize a, have a fan club established in their schools. But then they had to deal with uh, uh, some of these schools not having ICT facilities and then some not also being able to like um, install server and the likes uh -huh. in the um, schools, in the various schools. So having mm -hmm. Kiwiks, ha bringing new innovations like Kiwiks, which provide offline access for teachers and students to access uh, Wikipedia and some other Wikimedia projects right. is a big one. And I think uh, that is something that we want uh, more innovations like this in Africa. Mm -hmm. And we are also um, looking towards how we could not just make this information available offline, but also like providing offline editing access for Wikipedia and some other Wikimedia projects. Right. And I think it's something that uh, collectively we could identify and also uh, profile solution to. Thank Interesting. you. Interesting. Okay. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to put like a context, especially in Indonesian context. Um, I think it was interesting what Brahim said uh, previously, uh, that there are a lot of challenges that we have to deal with like differently like each country. And as for Indonesia, um, it took us around six, five, six years to be where we are right now with the education program. and. It's not. Uh, we're not even halfway to building the trust with the educational institutions about the Wikimedia projects. Like a lot of them, still, uh, they're not aware uh, on how to really make use of. Uh, especially, I'm, I'm talking like Wikipedia here because a lot of them only know Wikipedia and not like the other Wikimedia projects. So, yeah, a lot of them still don't know how to use Wikipedia. Um, or they just uh, ban their students from using Wikipedia. Don't use Wikipedia, and we're still deal with that. We're still dealing with that, and then especially with the impact of generative AI, mm -hmm. it's an extra work right. for us now. With the questions coming, like what's the future, and why why do I have to write on Wikipedia when I can just like type in and everything that I'm looking for is there. Right. Um, so it's it's an extra work for us. Um, but yeah, um, as I said before, we're trying to uh, educate them that, uh, uh, you know, there are, um, there are always like uh, something that, that we can do like as a, as a human that's more powerful like that, than the machine. And um, writing on like Wikipedia is also, it, it's also like actually like a way <laughs> to help like uh, the, the machine learn. So like, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if that's a, that's a correct way to put it, but um, 
uh yeah and uh what's what's actually uh what's actually growing is that the the awareness of of teachers uh with uh using like the digital platform is actually what we appreciate now okay. because there are more teachers that uh eventually they learn about like technology because i remember before the pandemic we had this training of trainers for teachers and um a lot of them uh they they didn't even know how to operate like a browser or something mm -hmm. it was difficult for them and now we've seen that uh, just like, improvement you know um a lot of them are more aware of like the use of technology and i think that's something that now we we appreciate as something that's uh really uh maybe it's not an innovation but it's something that um really helps to get the education moves forward okay in, so in indonesia just, just so we understand because this is interesting but uh, are you saying that the access to technology and the use of technology is rebuilding trust and more actors, you know, more um, education actors in Indonesia are more open now to using Wikipedia in their classrooms and things like that. Is there, you know, it's, and in that case, like what would potentially be the next step of that? Yeah, um, yeah, especially with the pandemic, then they relied, uh, they, they had to rely on technology, right? They had to rely on online platform and that's how they got to know like a lot of, like about like Wikipedia and um, we, uh, I had a conversation with a teacher, and uh, she used Wikipedia to to teach during the 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 online phase, like the lockdown, um, to teach. Uh, the, uh, she was taking like the online materials from it. So um, this is not maybe this is not innovation. This is not something new to us, but it's um, it's really refreshing to see the grow, um, yeah. and then. Uh, the awareness that okay there is like a wikipedia that i can use you know that uh, maybe there is not that much trust yet but the awareness itself that we really we really appreciate right now so that's yeah. that's the context for for hmm. indonesian so um that's why what we're trying to do here is to provide like an online course like online platform training yeah. uh, for them that they can uh use uh to learn more about wikipedia and we create like a uh, videos, uh, tutorials, and everything. So this is like our attempt yeah. to, uh, yeah, to improve the digital literacy. Fantastic. Yeah, well, innovation skills. doesn't always have to be loud and flashy. You no, know? it's about what's changing things as we know them. What is? What are the things that are sort of tackling, uh, enabling us to tackle the challenges, and you know, uh, cross the barriers or break down those barriers? And it's. It sounds like. In this case, for Indonesia, technology is beginning to come in as the innovative piece. Maybe, maybe within there's more to hear about that. Uh, but uh, I remember you you were nodding uh, as well. So what what's happening in Brazil? What are the new things? Yeah. So I I think in, uh, as you were saying, innovation is a word that we need to some extent to uh, understand in our broader, more complex way, mm -hmm. because sometimes innovation is adjusting to changing environments, so right. doing things just differently, so it's less innovation in technology or platform, is more uh, innovation in process. Right. One thing that has been happening in Brazil is, uh, is a changing law for public universities in which um, public university students need to, uh, do, to have in their curriculum 10% 10, 10 of their time at the public university spent on volunteer activities. Right. So this is a new law. And Brazil is a big country with many public universities. And the fact that this opportunity arose has led us to change the way that we are understanding the basic functioning of education programs in Brazil. In a sense that when we had education programs traditionally, there, there were in the setting of one professor dealing with uh, their classroom and then having uh, Wiki, the Wikimedia project as a platform for assessment, evaluating the students' learning. Mm -hmm. But here we are in an education setting in which students will have uh, a social activist acti uh, role 
in the, in to some extent a developmental strategy for the country. So this is shaping the way that we are framing the education programs, we are establishing uh, programs and uh, learning resources for the professors to be able to guide this, the students in these new activities. And this is going to be, we, ex we expect, in a different scale of work from the one we were used to, which were around dozens of professors in different universities that we were supporting to a sense in which we might be able to reach eventually hundreds of thousands of uh, students. Right. And when you deal with this changing environment, then you need to adjust. And this is, re so it, it's eventually not necessarily innovating, but reframing, changing the way that we even conceptualize the education program as such. And okay. This is the changing thing in Brazil right now. I, I'm, I'm curious because uh, earlier on you mentioned that one of the barriers that you now have to deal with is profiteering in education. So how is, you know, if you think of this work at the intersection of that, how is that, you know, um, what are the considerations and what's possible and can we remove profiteering from education in Brazil entirely from the work you're doing? So that's a, a good question and in in real terms, what is also happening in Brazil is the changing environment of big tech regulations. Okay. So we are currently uh, voting in Brazil a new, a new bill to have the platforms, the for-profit platforms, regulated as they were directly involved in the political uh, crisis in our country just recently. Right. And this will change the way that these platforms actually uh, operate in the country, so the bill hasn't passed a lot of political dispute, but in the same law we were able to establish an exception for the Wikimedia projects as they are related to education. Right. So, to some, so these two bills are independent, the one that we call the extension bill, which is the one for the 10% uh, student load on volunteer activities, but also the regulation of the platforms. And we see that as working together in a sense that we could create, so we could be uh, pioneering this uh, new ecosystem for volunteer work right. in students in a way that is not that affected by the big techs in Brazil that have their agendas and this agenda is for profit and it's been related to the, sh to the spread of fake news in Brazil uh -huh. and so on. So I actually think this is uh, an environment in which we could have a stronger ground than the for-profit corporations. Well, that's interesting. That's really great. Um, Frank, is there, what innovation should we look out for coming out of, would that be the U.S. and Germany? Well, when, when we, um, f for, our, for our instructors in, in our programs, I think that um, information literacy and um, and critical thinking have always been one of the things that were extremely important uh, for what they wanted to get out of our program. Um, and um, when you look at uh, the state of like media literacy in the United States, uh, there was a study conducted by Stanford University a couple of years ago that looked into uh, what is the status of that. And it turned out that like a large majority of students could not tell why getting information about climate change from uh, a website operated by an oil company was not a good idea. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and I think that in, in a world where more and more people get information online, um, critical thinking and, and media literacy are uh, such important skills. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing uh, looking into the future um, that, that uh, I think we're seeing is that uh, also data literacy. And uh, with that, I mean like ways to think about like how we can teach data literacy uh, by using Wikidata uh, as a platform. Uh, is certainly a thing that, that we think is, is something we're going to look into. Okay. Thank you. Um, Brahim, you haven't shared with us what innovative things are happening. And it's an interesting challenge that you have to deal with um, in, in a paper-based society. How do we innovate in knowledge and in education? 
So I think, as I said uh, before, uh, the big challenge was the negative perception about Wikipedia. So what we did uh, is talking to the press media and sharing information about uh, Wikipedia and Wikimedia movement and uh, its value. So, and that um, was spreading uh, sound about Wikipedia. So people start uh, to read about Wikipedia. And then uh, we get partnership with an association uh, called Network of Lecture in Morocco. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the biggest uh, opportunity because the member of this association was teachers. Okay. So uh, we did a communication session with them. So we explained uh, the value of the movement and how we can use Wikipedia inside the classroom. Then, so imagine from 2020, we start with 100 uh, teachers and now we reach uh, 800 Fantastic. in just three years. And uh, thank you. Now we are <laughs> starting the third edition uh, of uh, Reading Wikipedia and Classroom. Okay. And in each edition, uh, we did like uh, uh, study research. So we evaluate uh, the, uh, the operation and we share the results with government, with direct, uh, director, directorate, yes. So now we start receiving invitation from uh, from government right. to do training uh, in many region of Morocco so like there is a competitive uh, spirit between every region and now we have a second challenge that we don't have enough of uh, certificate training in Morocco to do training <laughs> for all region and that is a amazing for us because we didn't expect that we will get this result in just in three years mm -hmm. uh, especially after covid so uh, now people start talking about how we can uh, uh, how we can know more about wikipedia for example oer uh, um, so the problem i think or the challenge that we uh, we have now is communication. Right. So if we if the foundation can provide uh, like I don't know for example a videos talking about Wikipedia and how we can use Wikipedia inside classroom in all language, right, right, that will help. Okay. So for example, if I I am simple teacher, I will look for uh, information about Wikipedia, we'll just find in videos in uh, YouTube, for example, and that is not really up. Mm -hmm. So, or I will find uh, videos from community and I don't know, as simple teacher, how is, uh, how work uh, foundation and movement. I don't have any idea or any information uh, that there is a movement, there is people behind Wikipedia. Right. So when I will find information, I will find a lot of information. So I will stop. So if we can uh, regroup or collect all information and put it in official website of uh, Wikimedia Foundation, for example, so that will be one source that will serve all community and all in all language. So that will be easy for people, for teacher that uh, can trust the information that's provided uh, from the website mm -hmm. and for example, to to put uh, OER uh, uh, tools, there is no place. For example, you have to put in commons. But as I said, as simple teacher, I don't know how how can how can contribute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to have the right information yeah. to do that effectively. So uh, I think we should um, think as uh, in the place of those teacher. Mm -hmm because they are struggling to find information, they are struggling to, uh, they want to contribute, but they don't know how. Right, okay. So uh, we, we've shared uh, uh, some interesting things, um, look, uh, based on the challenges and the ways that we're looking to address those challenges. I'd like to learn a little about who we need on this journey to get to the destinations that we sort of um, talked about. How do we, uh, who do we work with 
um, for instance, to think a little differently about how we engage and the best ways to communicate and who are the people, sometimes you have gatekeepers in some communities, but who are those gatekeepers, for instance, that we need to engage with and talk to so that we can truly innovate from within our uh, wiki education movement so that we can truly educate and um, influence the world. But before, before I come back to the panel and ask that question, I'm taking a look at time, and I'm wondering if we have any questions, thoughts, or comments from the room before we get, uh, get back to the panel. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. A comment. Uh, all right, none yet. Selesh, did you? <laughs> no, he must. He must talk. Just prepping so, himself. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I can share a comment. Yeah. Okay. You know, like uh, before before joining the Wikimedia Foundation, I was also an organizer myself, and I was doing education program in my region, and I was like trying to understand like all the challenges that was being brought, and the innovations that we are talking about. I mean, this is something that I'm still thinking about, like. What would be the innovation, you know, in my region for that? Because when I was doing like education programs, like back in 2014, 2015, uh, like it's easy to say that you know go to college, go to universities, and do education programs, but it's hard to find like what's the right way. Because for me, it was always been like it's not about that like, going to the college and introducing Wikipedia to them. For me, it was also like. Okay, I have to teach them how to write Odia on the computer first. I have to teach them like this is this is the, this is the keyboard. These are like multiple keyboards you have. These are the things you have to use. These are the conjunction words. This is everything. So it takes a lot of effort, you know. Mm -hmm. Like when we think of like doing a, a program, when we think of like Wikimedia and education, we are doing two things actually: the digital literacy that we are thinking of. We're also introducing the students how to write on the computer by themselves. Because for me, I was the first generation ODIA to like look for something on the internet in my own script or contribute to the Wikipedia. So that's like something like a comment like I wanted to share, you know, like mm -hmm. listening to this panel. So it was amazing. Yeah, thank you. All right, interesting. Yeah, Rami, you have a thought? On I think. Sorry, yeah. Brahim. <laughs> yes, Brahim, you have a thought on that? Uh, I think we should talk about AWOC uh, uh, EduWiki uh, collabor Outreach Collaborator. It okay. was uh, an experience that uh, we should talk about. And I think it's innovative uh, experience because uh, that regroup all uh, contributors in, uh, in every region. And we, we start to talk about challenges of every country mm -hmm. and how uh, we can fi face those challenges. So uh, it was an amazing journey with Silesh, uh, and I think it should be uh, take in consideration uh, this experience because uh, it can give idea about ev every region, uh, the level or the rhythm that we can uh, have in uh, every country, okay. so we can uh, plan a scenario for the future, taking consideration all experience through EWOC uh, project. Okay, do you have, okay. <laughs> so let's take that into consideration. Um, Yoao, did you have something to say? I see you. <laughs> well, I can say something. They, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So one thing that we've learned, I think it connects to what you're asking, what's being said, is that uh, across the year, what we've learned from our campaign around education is, is that when we do a national campaigning, the universities that we bring along, the professors we bring along are generally, f even though they are coming from public university, they are from the wealthiest parts of the country. Mm. And a couple of years ago, we came up with is actually broader understanding that everyone, every time we were actually campaigning for Wikimedia education, we were to some extent ag aggravating the inequity of the educational system in Brazil. So I think since uh, 2015, there have been around 500 education programs in Brazil. Half of them were from a single university. 
a, the largest public university in Brazil, which is the wealthiest university in Brazil, which is the mm -hmm. University of Sao Paulo, the wealthiest state in the country, mm. which is fine. It's a really interesting university, but we wanted to decouple this understanding that Wikimedia and education is actually belongs more to the wealthier settings in educational systems. Right. But the problem is, like Salash was saying, that when you go to public universities in the countryside or in the Amazonian forest or in areas that have low connectivity, that don't have infrastructure, you are actually dealing with a level of complexities right. that are connected to the <laughs> fact that these are poorer, really poorer areas. Uh -huh. So when we come there and speak about the digital world, they have so many other priorities, just making sure that the roof of the school or the university doesn't collapse, right. that um, their level of challenge is different. So what uh -huh. we've learned from our experience is that more than focusing on the platforms or technical technological uh -huh. environment, right. the, the Wikimedia movement is also a different practice of education. Mm -hmm. So it's a collaborative practice that we sometimes encapsulate in the sense of the wiki way. Right. And this is, to some extent, uh, uh, not following the script of educational settings which individually students are doing one single thing and not necessarily collaborating but just creating a sense that what you know matters, so popular education matters, in a sense that you can actually establish in a setting, in a classroom, a sense of everyone building the same uh, knowledge base, this is already bringing them to the Wikimedia movement in a mm -hmm. way. Right. Despite the fact that we are not using Wikipedia because there is no connectivity, there is no electricity in some of uh, these areas. Right. And this, in Brazil, connects a lot to, uh, to uh, an educator, a theori uh, theoretical educator called Paulo Freire, who wrote a series of books called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, in which you challenge the idea that you come with a platform for education. And it's more in the sense that you need to build upon what people know and what they live. And sometimes bringing Wikipedia to some classrooms is actually not necessarily the good thing. It's better to actually bring the methodology of what we do right, more, more than, than the actual technological fetishism <laughs> of the project. Well, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, building on that um, and recognizing that in Brazil, in Africa, parts of Nigeria, and Indonesia and Morocco, we have panelists on the table. Who are the actors? that we need to bring into these conversations. If we're looking at the challenges in Morocco and what needs to happen, who are the actors we need to engage with? Should Brazil continue to find that big school and say, hey, you, have, you can do things differently? Or is this just something that a different group of people need to take forward? And who are the people to take along on that journey? In Nigeria, in Nigeria if we think about QX, if that is the way to take things forward, who are the people to scale that work and take it forward? Who do we need to engage with? And in um, Indonesia as well, how do we do it differently? You know, how do we move from paper-based in, um, in Morocco and who are the people? Is it still the government people? Is there some way to do something else? And are there people in the local communities that we can engage with to bring, uh, to bring education or bring the methodologies of education to them? Um, I like the way that you put it, Joao. Uh, I'm throwing this to you, panelists, and we have, uh, you know, if you can take a minute to share that, some of that, uh, some thoughts on the actors we need to, yes, okay. actors and stakeholders, yeah. Okay, um, so talking about stakeholders, I think uh, most times what we do as organizers is that we tend to focus more on our participants, uh, uh, that is the primary stakeholders, most times that's what we do, and then we only reach out to uh, the secondary stakeholders, those in the government, uh, those organizations who would have helped us project, uh, 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 like um, not really just amplify the project or like make it uh, give their recommendation. Most times we tend to leave them out of the um, planning process mm -hmm. and even the implementation process. 
So this makes it a, a lot difficult to align our programs and activities with what is already in existence. So I feel what we need to do is, rather than just reaching out to this big organization uh, for recognition, we also need to involve them in the process of what we are doing. They need, we need to get their voices. We need to get their inputs. Because if we can get their inputs, then it would also help us see how we can really align what we do with uh, what is What's already really in happening existence. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I think that's where we need to improve upon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I would like to like cite an instance. While I was implementing the reading Wikipedia in the classroom, I reached out to UNESCO. And the, re the main reason why I reached out to UNESCO was for recognition. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Because Fair yes, enough. UNESCO is a big name and if you can get them on board, fine. It mm -hmm. makes the project very big and then everybody gets to know about it. Then along the line, I discovered that there's this um, e um, existing media and information literacy guide that was already uh, prepared and published by UNESCO. Right. So when um, I, I, I reached out to uh, UNESCO, they wanted to also see the course model that we, uh, we intend to use for the teachers. So presenting the course model and then um, trying to compare it with the existing UNESCO MIL, I, I um, add like a clearer um, understanding of, okay, yes, uh, this course model um, aligns well with what is already in existence. Mm -hmm. And then uh, UNESCO was also able not to just um, accept uh, the project, but also like uh, go over what some of the resources that we have already. And so this really made it uh, impactful right. and it made it a whole lot of success. So I think instead of just seeing our stakeholders as one of those big people that gives us recognition, we should try to also make them become part of the process, the planning, mm -hmm. the implementation, because getting their insight, getting their recommendation would go a long way to help us improve what we do. Thank you. All right. Thank you, too. Frank, yes. Yeah, my answer goes in, this, in the same direction. I think it's always that we need to pay attention to the context that uh, people locally are operating in. And that means that the one natural ally that we have, whether it's in Morocco or in the United States or somewhere else on the planet, are the educators. And they're, uh, they're even, even within a, a specific country, uh, they're dealing with a, a very different context sometimes. So uh, when you talk to someone who's at a prestigious university like Harvard, uh, or at someone who's at a rural community college, those are people that were uh, the, the answer of how we fit in it might be a very, very different one. And I think we need to listen to those people. They are our natural allies. And we need to better understand of where they're coming from and then adapt our answer to what their needs are and what the needs of their, their learners are. Right. Okay. Um, I'll be coming back to the audience. Do we have any thoughts, comments, questions that we want to ask our panelists? I think we have time for maybe one or two. One. Okay. <laughs> Liana. We just need one. Okay, so one. I thought you had a question. So one question from our audience. Okay, looks like our panel hashed it out completely. Awesome. <laughs> yes. Um, can I share also like something in, yes. um, in response to that? Um, I think what's been interesting in um, our community in Indonesia is um, for Indonesia, the community, the volunteers have been like the backbone of our projects now. Um, we have only a few people that have a background as educators who really go into the field and do the trainings. The rest of it are done by our volunteers who are not even experts in education, but they have experience of editing Wikipedia and they are able to connect it with the 
uh, with the educational part. So this is what we are going to continue to try to grow, and I hope that I will see this in the next few years, is that our communities have grown independent, uh, and they will be able to independently organize their education projects. Uh, because right now, um, they can organize, but they still need like the guidance from us. But I really hope that the communities grow, and I really hope that this is what I will see maybe in the 2030 that okay. our communities will uh, will have grown and will have been able to organize the education projects by themselves and maybe come up with creative ideas or creative strategies um, because these volunteers have been just like actively going to the universities giving trainings to the students and also like to the teachers and they right. have no experts in mm -hmm. educational field right. but their experience uh, were what uh, built them that they are able to stand um, in front of the students and talk about uh, what is the benefit of using Wikipedia uh, in the classroom. So uh, for us, in Wikimedia Indonesia, not only that we also have planned to uh, have more collaboration with mission aligned organizations and that's that's uh, that's of course like this for sure but also uh, developing our communities uh, I think is what we are going to continue to do in the next few years all right yeah. fantastic thank you. thank you so much to our panelists today we've shared some very interesting conversations all right and thank you for indulging me <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you for this session. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, I would like to invite you now uh, for a group uh, for a group <laughs> photo. Sorry. Uh, so uh, you can go to the restaurant. We will guide you. Uh, it's um, you're going through the restaurant through the door in the backyard, and we will take a photo uh, from the stairs. So uh, just sorry. Um, bear in mind uh, that the grass is a little bit wet from the rain. So. It, it might be uh, a little slippery, so please bear in mind that, but I hope it will be okay.
Ok, eu acho que podemos começar. Fala, Filipe. Mas eu não estou vendo Elvin aqui. Oh! <laughs> Sorry. So, um, we are going to start um, our next block of sessions and first presentations, uh, presentation is uh, Elvin's. He's going to talk about um, current situation uh, of secondary school teachers in Peru. So uh, we, I think, uh, all know how um, some situations, external factors, um, our context uh, in which we are uh, working and living can affect, affect our work. So I think Alvin is going to uh, present um, his uh, experience from Peru. Here you go. Hi to everyone, thank you for attending this uh, talk. Yes, um, I'm Elvin Woman and I will present more or less my experience about running Wikipedia, reading Wikipedia in the classroom. And uh, the topic specifically is the pedagogy in crisis in Peru. So how we can uh, more or less help the teachers by bringing Wikimedia projects to the education. Uh, this is a short video about me, I will explain a little bit where I come from, I come from Peru in a town called Nuñoa. It's a Quechua town in the south of Peru, and we mainly speak in Quechua language. And besides that, um, my journey uh, began in 2019 when I first attended the Wikimania conference in Stockholm, and there I decided to join to the team because uh, to the Wikimedia movement in general, I don't have an affiliation or any user group, but I do it by myself. So the idea was to go to my town and bring this Wikipedia, something that uh, my town probably or all communities, minoritized communities, they are not aware of, that our language is important and our language needs some representation and some visibility on the web and also in, in the society in general. And with this idea, I spend more or less one or two months uh, every year to, I, I go to Peru because I'm based in Austria, but I dedicate one or two months in a year to go to Peru and bring the Wikimedia projects there. And so for that, I, 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 I run several uh, ideas and projects about uh, how to bring, how to bring Wikipedia there. So uh, the first attempt was to call, uh, attend, uh, to go to the radio station because this is the main uh, communication model for the Kichwa people. So I invite them to join to a workshop about Wikipedia and they were so excited about this but somehow they, they don't have enough time to attend to these kind of talks and also the topic is quite new and so on. So it's interesting but they don't have um, enough, uh, they feel that they don't have enough skills or knowledge to 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 apport on this uh, on the Wikipedia. So we gather a small um, people there where I explained what I was doing it and what was the idea about creating, for example, Quechua articles in the Wikipedia in Quechua and how to make, 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 uh, make the Quechua knowledge present on the web, basically. So all these ideas came up and we basically meet in a, a school in the town. And as you can see, there are four people there and there is only one, one girl. So this is also one, something that I noticed since the beginning of this journey. And well, it was also during the pandemic, so it was really hard to, to gather people in such a context. And at the end of this session, what I learned from that experience was that it, it will not be easy. So it's not easy, I think, also for all, any other community, because it's always, there's an enthusiasm, there is an, a lot of motivation, but probably at the beginning you don't see results. So, but this is totally fine because I don't go for gather a million people, but I go for these ones that are interested and they come and they attend and they want to share their experience, they want to contribute as well. So this was this experience in, in, in Peru and it was a tough journey, but it's still it's going. So it's still going because I'm still working on that idea because I, I think Wikipedia is important for all of us. And so what is the outlook of my presentation? I will talk uh, why uh, Wiki Andes, this is the group that um, I'm trying to form in Peru, and also how to do pedagogy in 
uh, in free knowledge using all these Wikimedia projects and also what we have learned so far, some data, statistics and, and some experience about uh, this journey and towards Wikimedia 2030. So why Wikimedia Andes, as I called, I, I, my, my, our team is called Wiki Andes, but I think in the future it could somehow it's a dream, but it could be something like a Wikimedia Andes. So I will, I will, I will fight for that. And I will explain why. Um, well, we are four people currently, and we work on this Wiki Andes project, and our mission is basically to develop and strengthen 21st century skills for all, so not no one behind. This is the current uh, geographical map, as you can see, and you can take it as a thematic or uh, geographic thing, if you see this, this, this uh, map. However, I have to mention that more, more of the well-established communities or languages are more or less occupying most of the landscape in, in South America. So it's Spanish, it's Portuguese, and other languages, and the minorities are being relegated in, in this context. So now uh, we will go to specifically to the context of Peru. And what I found there, more or less, it's a gender gap in the Andes. This is uh, my town, and as you can see, there are 15 people there, but only three are women. So there are still things to fight for. Then, um, since we don't have, uh, we are suffering uh, marginalization because uh, during these last months, as you can maybe uh, have read in the news, there are a lot of fights uh, from the Quicho communities, Aymara communities, uh, that went to the capital city, to the capital of Peru, to say uh, we have our rights and we uh, want to change the things. We don't, we don't want to wait anymore, so any, any time more, because we need the changes. So we, don't, we are not part of the making decision also. We are, um, the technology is not arriving where we are, where we live. So the education, for example, during the COVID, it was based on the radio. So if you imagine the situation, so the first and second grade listening the radio during the, uh, from 8 to 10 a.m. and from 10 to 12, the third and fourth grade of the school. So this, is, this shouldn't happen. And what we are having also is an educational crisis. That's what uh, the topic is mainly about. And there are groups, for example, saying, okay, we will teach them. We will, uh, we will show how the technology is advancing and so on, but all the courses are in Spanish. And you are talking with people that are living in the Andes, uh, talking in Quechua language. And this is something um, I think should be changed because even if they uh, speak or learn Spanish, I think the society should change in a way that they could teach also in Quechua language. Now, uh, how to do pedagogy in free knowledge. Here I explain more or less the ideas that we came up to bring these Wikimedia projects to the Andes. So the main goal in this um, is to basically democratize the contributions based on the users or contributors' skills. So we don't force them, we don't tell them, okay, you should edit Wikipedia because we are doing this. No, this is not the way. So what we do is basically focus on several things like writing, because we never learn how to write in Quechua, or reading, because we never read a book in Quechua, but we can do this kind of thing. So according to what they want, what they would like to contribute, so we, for example, develop um, uh, some projects that I will explain now, and also how to, uh, for example, if you didn't listen uh, Quechua from another region or another country, so also this is important and relevant for, for our community, for the Quechua in general. So regarding reading, uh, well, I, I showed them, uh, for example, yesterday I was explaining about reading Wikipedia in the classroom, and the idea of bringing this uh, program is to empower them and to show them that they can more or less use the Wikipedia for reading in Quechua language, but also for evaluating the content there, contributing there. So this is the idea, and in this context, we reach out to more than 500 teachers. We, 30, we are planning to certify more than 50 teachers in 2023, and also we, are, we already have two certified trainers, and we are I started, we started the, the implementations in the region of Puno, but we are looking for expanding these implementations around Peru. And also we have several collaborations with Bolivia as well in order to use and improve the materials or the assets in Quechua language, Aymara language, and Guarani language. So this is also really important for us. 
This is our experience. Uh, this is a room at the university and how we explained the reading Wikipedia in the classroom program. There were some difficulties to run the program in uh, on-site mode, so we changed it to the hybrid mode, also to the fully online mode. So, and about writing, how they can, for example, um, continue with the writing of Quechua is uh, through Wikisource. I, I, I think you all know Wikisource, but you can, for example, there uh, upload a document in a native language and the contributor can, for example, transcribe this content. And you can practice some new words or learn how to write in Quechua. Then, uh, regarding writing, for example, I, uh, I collaborate with a science club in Quechua in Peru since 2020. And every year, I dedicate also one month, more or less in September, where we uh, basically train or teach 40 students around the world. Um, they are from Kichwa communities as well. And we join in a, in a way that they can learn new methods, technologies. Also, they can bring up new words and gather a community there. So this is Science Clubs in Quechua. And about speaking, for example, you have several tools uh, that are uh, around Wikimedia projects. One of the best ones that I, I know is uh, Lingua Libre, where you can, for example, if a user, if a Quechua speaker wants only to contribute with the voice, so we can show them how to do it, or we can just do it to, all together. So just one person creates a user account, and this person selects a, little, a list of words, and these words are read by the, by the Quechua speaker. So, and these voices are recorded, I, uh, upload, uh, are uploaded into Wikimedia Commons, and then you can use it. And regarding that, for example, it was not easy to gather the community, so what we did was to start a radio program, so to show them how important it is to have our language, our voices on the web recorded. And so in this radio program, basically what we did was to not only um, play songs from uh, folklore music in Quechua, but also, for example, rock in Quechua, uh, salsa in Quechua, and all these kind of uh, genres of music, so they can be aware that this kind of music exists, this kind of songs exist. And also, not only from Peru, so we also play songs uh, from Ecuador, from Bolivia, and how different are they? And also, they can learn new words because they are listening a different dialect. So this was the intention, and also they were so interested on that. So if you want to listen, the playlist is there in the QR code. So, okay, and also once you, for example, um, you have some recordings in the Lingua Libre in the Wikimedia Commons, you can also retrieve this data. And if you are practicing the listening in this case, so you can just play these words and uh, learn how to pronounce these words. So. It's basically, you can use this, this technology. Also, you can work with a spoken Wikipedia. You can ask someone that read, to read an article in Quechua so it can be recorded and uploaded in Wikimedia Commons, and then you can use it in a Wikipedia article. And also, if the user is more advanced or it has a university level, for example, we try to, well, this is actually for more general um, users, more young people, but, um, we want to document the traditions, the culture, and so on uh, from the region of Puno. So we decided to uh, show them Wikimedia Commons and how to basically uh, take pictures and basically, basically that. So uh, we made a contest bringing Nuno's Carnival to Wikipedia. So basically, there was a contest for uh, of photos of uh, musicians, artisans, and videos about them. So because the traditions are not the same every year and they are changing, the clothes, the colors, and so on. So it's important to capture these this changes, this evolution as well. And I think from the result of this, we improved the Wikipedia article of the town and we include more photographies and pictures there. And also the, the municipality, for example, said, okay, this is a good idea actually, so we can do it next year. But still it's a, a ongoing so this is some ideas that they can maybe not uh, um, they are not um, for example aware of so I just tell them okay we can do this and I can help you and we can we can manage to do it together and for more technical users or contributors we for example are planning or we are we, we have built a knowledge base for linguistic uh, aspect of Quechua and also for general knowledge so basically, we have a wiki-based instance where we store 
the linguistics um, topic of the Quechua language and where we already have more than one million statements there and we are planning to record the voices of the verbs, nouns and all these words and we collect dictionaries, vocabularies that are in PDF format or in an unstructured format but then we convert it into a structured format so we can afterwards link it to Wikidata. And so here, for example, you can see a lexem and then the senses in different languages and also some examples of the use of this word and where you can find this source. So what we have learned so far is uh, in this journey to build inclusive, innovative, harmonious and democratic spaces of contributions for all, basically uh, we located in the region of Puno and we work on during the January to June, but this work started since 2019. So it's um, hard to tell how many people we reach. And the gender is still an uh, uh, issue. Uh, it's only the 34% it's women. Then we have how young people is not also not that involved on this, um, on, on, the, on the, basically on the instructions or the, on the courses. Then also mostly public um, uh, workers or participants are more from public institutions. And the ideal days for the training programs, for example, for teaching them or for talk with them, it's basically Saturday or Fridays or Mondays. And the times are between 5 to 7 p.m. or between 6 to 8 p.m. because during the day they don't have time for doing it. Then also we asked many things about the encyclopedias, the quality of information, and if they believe that it's uh, reliable or not. Then we also have more how they access the, the encyclopedias in general. We also have what resources they use for plan their lessons, and also we ask if they use Wikipedia. Certainly, they, uh, the 48% they use Wikipedia and other educational websites. And also we ask what sources of information do you know and to what extent do you consider them to be reliable. Then, for example, you can see the textbooks are, has a higher score and also maybe websites. So this is something uh, to, to, to know as well. Are you familiar with training courses as well? We ask them. Uh, I think during the COVID they also uh, made some courses and we, we can show that they are, um, they are more uh, used to online courses. And also what they like about this, what they, their motivation about taking these courses or workshops, it's new ideas, basically new ideas, certification, okay, uh, but also meet other teachers. I think this is, building this community is hard and also between the edu education, um, edu wiki, we are trying to do this, right? So beer and gather the community all together. Also, we ask where do you find professional training opportunities and mostly they are uh, finding it in social media. So, yeah, think about that. So, how we are doing it towards Wikimedia 2030? Well, we are proposing this innovative space for doing pedagogy in the, in the free knowledge ecosystem because not, we are not forcing them, we are just showing them if they are, would like to um, contribute on this way or on that way. So basically there are different uh, methods to do it and we are just showing them how to do it and they would decide what, what they can do. Um, also, we are seeing ways to engage the community and basically how to engage with minority communities because for example, the program radio was an idea to gather them, to show them how important are their voices. And pedagogy is a good investment. It gives more and better opportunities to all. Then people are more likely to engage with society, education, and employment. So it's important what we are doing now. And towards Wikimedia 2030, we seek to drive and facilitate innovation that will help us to basically improve user experience, uh, bring uh, inclusive and equality. And I just want to finish as yesterday, I truly believe that. So what we are doing in, on pedagogy is that we need new, um, new approaches. And that's why we are here. That's why we are gathering together to bring up more ideas and building new ecosystems for education. So thank you for, for your attention. <laughs> if there's any question.
Uh, th thanks. Uh, oh, yeah. Thanks for this uh, session because I found it really interesting. There was a thing that uh, punched me because I felt uh, like really appealed. I mean, I felt appealed in many of the slides, but uh, there is one particular slide when we can see what is uh, the text of a drama, of a, of a theatrical work. And to me, it's really funny because it's uh, the same situation that had the Catalan language. It's a, it's a previous slide. Uh, is there really the same situation that the Catalan language had in Valencia in the 19th century, uh, where most of the literature, I, I guess that with Quechua language will be the same for what I've seen. Uh, most of the literature was theater because as being a literary, I mean, there was a time where people Mm, there were a lot of people who were able to even read, and those who were, who were able to read were taught in Spanish. So we have the, the theater as the only way of having actual literature because as it was made as a representation, it was appealing for the audience. And to me it's really funny because I see that the intertext, the explanations are in Spanish which is the exact same situation that the Catalan language had in the 19th century in Valencia. You know, uh, uh, then, uh, sorry for making it long, my, my question is, um, when we work with that kind of works in Valencia, it happens that uh, our language got the normalization in the 30s, depending on the region in the, te in the um, 110 years ago or 90 years ago. And the thing is that those texts from the 19th century are very difficult to understand by Wikisource because they are written uh, using an anarchic color orthography, let's say. So my question is, uh, do you have that kind of problems while using Wikisource? I mean, uh, Wikisource does understand Quechua, let's say, automatically, or do you have to make a lot of work of rebuilding the text that is given from the original source? Um, thank you for the question and basically what we do here is kind of uh, editathon. So we gather people and we invite them. We upload a document and somehow the experienced user, for example, they type it really easy. They transcribe the text and some of them try to use, for example, the automatic uh, transcriber. And it, work, it works quite well. So you also have two options. I think there are two transcribers uh, algorithms inside the wiki source. So they, use, they try to use do, both of those. and they just fix it by small um, yeah, errors. Is it compulsory to learn Quechua in the primary school? No, no. We, we actually, we, we are not educated in Quechua at all. So even in the primary, nor, nor in the secondary, not in the university. But I found uh, universities around Europe and US that they teach like a, a proper career of three years teaching Quechua and I met them in Paris talking in Quechua. So that's, yeah. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the very comprehensive and uh, and uh, the, the presentation that gave a very good overview of the different uh, activities. I wonder, when do you talk to teachers in the region? And when it is about the kind of content that is most important for your Wikipedia language version. So what kind of topics for the young readers? Do you have a certain idea which topics would be the most useful or the most appreciated? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. And basically, in this context, we work with uh, prof with teachers, and they, for example, they have a, a curriculum. And in the curriculum, for example, we uh, show them if there's article of, uh, article about, for example, um, the small town or pre Inca town around uh, an old town around our village. So they can say, okay, it's not there. So maybe we can do some research, and we went, we can work on that. So also the information has to be updated, for example, okay, let's look at our district. Who is the, the, the measure of our district? And they found out that it's not updated. So they started to fix these ma uh, minor changes, ma making these minor changes, and they realized, okay, this is the way how we can do it. So we can not only work on our district, but maybe we can do it the next district as well. And also we can add more 
uh, organizational stuff that are relevant for us or more up, we can talk more about the mountain so they actually in the in the, in the in the meeting they say we would like to focus on these things so we of course guide them through the more local uh, knowledge but they decide what to contribute and how um. Congratulations for this beautiful project. And I'm uh, very curious about this idea of uh, science clubs in, in Quechua. So who is um, performing these, these workshops? Are there scientists that speak Quechua? Have you mapped uh, more, let's say, uh, scientifics that speak Quechua that could uh, uh, help these science clubs? Yeah, thank you for the question. And yes, so we are basically from all over the world. We born in Peru. We were born in Peru, and but we still speak Quechua. And we decided to gather in a series of workshops. So in a, during the month, every weekend, we develop some courses about, for example, let's say uh, botanic, history, astronomy, and so on. And also, I about uh, I talk about uh, computer science. I talk about the Wikipedia, Wikimedia projects, and so on. And we show them all the possibilities that they can, uh, uh, they, can, they, they can have for building new words, for using the kitchen knowledge, and all these things. So, yeah. Any other question? Okay. Thank you. Okay, our next session is an Ask the Wikimedia Foundation board session with our three trustees, except it looks like Rosie got distracted. Um, <laughs> so I wanna first start by thanking all three of them for uh, attending the conference and being willing to put together this last minute session, um, which we put on the uh, agenda yesterday when uh, we had a participant not able to actually be here. So thank you very much to them for uh, their willingness to jump in here. Um, I want to start by asking each of them to introduce themselves. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's a great idea. Sounds good. While everyone's coming closer, maybe, Shani, do you want to start in by introducing yourself? I think everyone knows me. Okay. So. So, yeah, hi. I'll introduce myself to those. Oh, here. Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Rosie Stevenson Goodnight, and I have edited as Rosie Step since 2007. I've been a member of the Board of Trustees uh, since uh, 2021. Uh, hi. My name is Victoria Dorodina, and my nick in Wikipedia is Victoria. I am from Eastern Europe. I live in the UK, and I've been editing since 2006 and uh, on the board of trustees uh, since 2021. Uh, also, as some of you know, I have the best music here. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I think I, I may say something about my Go for role. It. So you all know me uh, from yesterday, I hope. Um, so hi again, and thanks, Liana, for, for hosting us uh, in this session. I am, um, in terms of my trusteeship, maybe it's worth mentioning that I've been a trustee since 2019, so this is my second term now, and I am the vice chair of the board and the chair of the community affairs committee. Um, and really happy to be here with all of you. So this is basically a session for you, also with us, maybe Yael. Yael, can you say hi to everyone? Hi, everyone. I'm Yael. I'm the Foundation. Ah, 
Thanks, Liana. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Yael Weisberg, the Vice President of Community Growth at the Foundation. So I lead the community resources teams, which is the grant making team, um, the community development team, community programs, which you all know because of the, edu the amazing education work that they help support, and uh, the partnerships team. So I'm happy to be here. Yes, and the reason why I asked uh, Yael to introduce herself, although she's not a trustee, she is one of our, tra uh, our staff members, is that uh, we may defer some of your questions to her if it's too operational. The board, this is maybe a good reminder that the board is um, a body that does more strategic work. And if your questions are going to be too operational or too, mi too much connected, we'll just defer you to Yael. So that's why maybe you can come closer to us. Yes. So, Liana? Yeah? OK. Who has a question? Not everyone at once. Masab. Hi everyone, my name is Musab. Uh, I had a question to the board about, uh, you know, education program because it's a, a, an educational, uh, you know, conference. Uh, we used to, to work with education department and the foundation. There was uh, uh, our, one of our friends called Ty Flanagan, uh, you might know him, before, the, like, in my experience, as I am running education program since 2015, it was more smoother in my, like, to apply. For example, we do, like, courses and we want to uh, give some certificates to the students, give some like simple prizes like going through grant when there is like a, a responsible you know stakeholder at the foundation what very easy now uh, you will apply for rapid grant and then like you have no specificity for your application nobody like to to contact to fast in the process or like to to telling him about your special need or such so i i, I hope that the group pro the program of the you know you know wikipedia education program like still have like some you know stakeholder like department, let's say, at the foundation, so that it's like responsible of increasing the the scope because we still have countries that have no education programs. Um, so, like by having uh, somebody like with direct with direct direction in the in the foundation, I found this will be like making our program uh, much expanding and uh, much easier. That's my point of view. So, what is your question? <laughs> the question is that why this like this this thing like this department is no longer in the foundation. Uh, they, we used to to work with them so easy, and then the, this like um, um, the responsible guy like went away, and we don't know why this program was cancelled. Yeah. Thank you, Mossab. That's. Can you just give the mic to Yael? Because that's a, a great example of an thanks. operational question. Yeah, thanks, Wasab. Uh, so we do still have the education team at the foundation. Um, the person responsible is actually in a different session right now, Ben. And you know Selesh and Melissa, who are both here. So it sounds like you've had some problems getting um, knowing who to connect with, and that we can help solve, and I'm sorry it's been difficult, but I just want to name two things. So one, the, the team is very much still here. Um, the second point is that this is the first time, I think, at least I've been at the foundation for about four and a half years now, and at least in my tenure, this is the first time that we've actually named education as a core priority in our annual plan this year. And so you'll see that that's something that we um, really believe, oh, the mic just got louder. <laughs> um, something we really believe is important for the foundation to support, but in a potentially new and different way. So I think the foundation is looking at ways that we can better support you in the movement doing an ed education work and maybe investing ourselves in education programs a little bit less. The theme, uh, yeah, the way we're supporting. So really looking to, to better support the education work that's happening in the movement, but carrying out less programmatic work ourselves as a foundation. Why I'm asking this because before we were approached by the by the foundation like when I was like um, I was just a student at Hashimoto University and had been approached by uh, by like the foundation so they were like searching for us to uh, support us now like it's like like um, we need to know who's the, st the responsible guys so I'm thinking like we should in be in bigger collaboration so both search for the, for each other because like I know there is education team and though I know there is education foundation but like um, um, we we don't have like, uh, let's say, regular contacts or you know, um, like scheduled meetings so that we can like know where you reach in your program. Do you have any difficulties? Uh, you, we can support them. I'm just saying about this. Actually, my comment. Actually, um, the user group does have monthly meetings, but or y yeah, yes. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I can take this from the user group perspective, which is, I think, you know, we in the Wikipedia and Education user group are interested in better collaborating with the foundation's education staff and making sure um, we're sort of looking to a future where we're supporting all of the educational efforts across uh, across the globe. And I think Shani mentioned this in her keynote yesterday around their sort of disparate groups in the movement that are providing support, but it hasn't been coordinated very well. And I think one of the things we are particularly interested in, and I mean we here as the user group, the foundation's education staff, um, you know, everyone who's putting together this conference, who's been collaborating together to make this event happen, we want to make sure that we are bringing that spirit of collaboration and coordination to the movement in the future. Um, I will also plug, Cornelius is currently running a needs finding session in the Belgrade room, um, and there will be a repeat of it right after lunch, and I would strongly encourage you to participate in that because the specific needs of kind of what support is your program not getting that it should be getting in the future is exactly what we're trying to determine through that session. And so Yael mentioned Ben, who's leading the education efforts at the foundation right now. He is currently in that other room facilitating that needs finding uh, work with Cornelius. So I would strongly encourage you, if you have specific needs for your program, to participate in the afternoon session of that. I, I also want to comment specifically more strategically around education, and then Rosie has some, some more insights to share. So I can say that from the board's perspective, thematic work in general that is happening across different countries is important. I think we're at a very unique moment in the history of the foundation and our movement where we're trying to reassess and reimagine how we're doing things because um, some of the previous models are not working well for us, Sim as simple as that. And as we grow and as we have more reach and as we mature, we need to find new ways to do things. And I think um, we are very thankful as the board to Yael and to the various user groups and entities in the movement um, for being so open and so flexible in their thinking because it's not easy to make changes, right? People are used to certain things and suddenly we're saying, hey, this is not working anymore. Well, at least not as well as it could, or it's not serving our mission and vision, the joint one together. So, hey, we need to reimagine it. And really, part of why all of us are here at this conference is to do this new thinking together and try to reimagine how it may look like. And it is a priority a strategic one for the foundation. Yeah, El mentioned this is part of our now annual plan. And there has been another effort done by our CEO, Mariana Iskander, to actually tie the whole annual planning of the Wikimedia Foundation much closer to our strategic movement vision, right? So this is a new thing. We've been doing it not so long. Um, previous leadership did not really do it in this way. and. It takes time. So be patient with us, communicate with us. We are looking exactly to do what you wanted, to be more coordinated globally and to have a shared vision and a shared understanding of where it is that we want to go. And I think all of us recognize the power and the maturity, specifically from all the, the entities in the movement of the education group um, or the education community in helping us re-examine how it might look like. So this is for us sort of a case study. We don't have the answers. We are here to find the answers together and to find whether or not it works. And we might, by the way, we might try things and fail. And that's absolutely fine. We some, some of us call it failing forward. So we try, we, or like our strategic direction, right? We try something, we evaluate it, and we iterate. I guess we're going to have a lot of that in the coming year, few years. Um, but I'm excited, and we're all excited about the opportunity to actually reimagine it and, and have the partners to do it. This has not been the case in the... It's a, it's, I did really mean it. This is a unique moment in time that hasn't, like the star have aligned for this to happen now. 
and all the different entities are ready to do this work and it wasn't the case previously. Rosie? Well, you covered a lot of what I was going to say, but let me add to that that this is a unique moment and that the annual plan for this year, um, if you've had a chance to review it, tells that we're going to focus on um, three particular areas um, to give it more of a focus than we ever had before. And education is number one on that list, culture is on there too, and as is gender. Along with those three, there's also um, much larger focus on product and technology, which is going to be very helpful in the work that we do, particularly for education, but also for culture and also for gender. So exciting times. We're doing this together. We're looking outward as much as we're looking at inward, which is a new approach. And everything we do is tied to the strategic work that we started back in 2016. We got its strategic direction in 2017. We came up with 10 recommendations in 2020. We have 45 um, initiatives that we're working on, all of it to bring us towards 2030. And this year, it's education, culture, and gender. So again, exciting times that we're doing together, which is why we're all not just in this room, but in three rooms having these kinds of conversations. Vicky, do you have anything to add? I wanted to say is that uh, to clarify the role of the board in all of this, uh, when we met in New York, the uh, board has uh, two annual meetings, and there was also MCDC there uh, that works on the movement charter, and endowment board, which is a separate organization, and we had a joint session which considered education and possible ways to uh, promote education and to join together all these dots that Shani was talking about. Because we are on the stage where there is a lot of information, but it's all uh, separated and people don't know what other people are doing, right? So the foundation's uh, role probably will be in connecting all these dots and providing framework for the education. And in the annual planning, the money, everybody I think is interested in money, for the grants was increased uh, by one third, so it's not 15 million. And because education provides significant part of the outreach, uh, I would say that it means uh, that there will be more resources. Mehman. Yeah. Ah, okay, thank you. Who is not, no, uh, me, I'm Mehman from Georgia. Uh, and from AFCOM, and yeah, from? Yeah, and from AFCOM, and from uh, different, uh, okay. Uh, just about coordination, the coordination within the foundation, like affiliates and community to, uh, to the foundation is so difficult for some years and uh, this is one of the main issue. Uh, for example, C region we are used as of as a contact point to the foundation for the years. Uh, now there is language facilitators and we can uh, use them. Uh, who read the foundation APP like annual plan? Uh, there is clearly a road that uh, there will be uh, a good front door. Uh, for the, in the foundation. So I'm hoping that in the coming years we, we will have a good front door in the foundation to reach out the different departments and different people uh, who will know what we are doing and what we want from the foundation. So maybe in coming years it will be fixed that issue with the coordination. What is your question? No, it just comment. Oh, a comment. Okay. Florence. Okay, maybe I'm going to ask a weird question and maybe going a little bit backward. Um, for me in education, I'm mostly interested in the offline education. So all the people not connected and it's just not a detail. The question I wanted to ask is, 
you keep repeating that you are going, uh, we are in a new era where things are going into the new direction, new thinking, blah, blah, blah. So I absolutely uh, think that all of us agree that the tech was a problem, lots of problems, lots of things delayed and so on. But I, I, I cannot really uh, see what was a problem in the, edu in the way the education was working. So what... So yeah, I'm interested that I can, as you, I can a, talk as a board member, so much about that. Yeah, but, but it, give us I, a couple I of examples. I honestly think it yeah. doesn't really relate to the board. So can we, oh. um, can we maybe see if there are other questions to the board? And if yeah. not, I can comment on that and I can share okay. some of the issues. Okay. okay. okay because yeah. it's completely non-related to the board. Well, except, except the board still gives the general direction and typically changing from a situation where the, the foundation the history. is... Sorry? You're, you're talking about the history of what, what, what were the issues, oh, right? What are the issues the last few years that emerged in education that made you decide that there wouldn't be so much directly being done by the Wikimedia Foundation, but more uh, the foundation giving support to the FEA to do things about education, which seems to be the new, new direction for okay, education so strictly. So you, the board made a decision about this. It's not only an operational issue. So I was just wondering if you had some feedback on this. Yes, so that's indeed not, not really connected actually to education, but I would say rather to the scope of everything that we do. So, where to even begin answer that? Well, when Mariana joined as CEO, some of you may remember that she did a mapping exercise. I keep reminding this mapping exercise because I think that was a brilliant move on her behalf because I think many of the issues that, we've, that have come up in our movement in the last few years stem from the fact that there is a lot happening, but historically we didn't have necessarily owners to who's doing exactly what. And I really appreciated Mariana taking the time to map the different things and check hey, who's responsible for that and who's responsible for that? Because that informed a deeper discussion on everything that the foundation does. And the reality, honestly, is the foundation cannot do everything. It just can't, not well. So it's about understanding exactly what it is that we want to do and can do and need to be the, the owners of and drive properly and then what we can't. And then not only just say we can't touch that, but actually find new owners to these gaps of, of ownerships in the movement. And I think historically what happened is that everyone just assumed the foundation can do everything. And I mean, you're a previous board member, you know how this works, but people just expect the foundation to cover everything and to be responsible for everything. And that's just not the reality that we all have. Um, and I think education was just one of many, many um, things that weren't really covered properly for years. Not because people didn't want to, just because we have limited resources. And again, when I say limited resources, I wanna, I wanna acknowledge, yes, we have a, a hundred and, and uh, almost $75 million uh, um, uh, budget for yearly. It's, it's becoming smaller now, but roughly, right, at least last year. And it sounds like really a lot of money for some people. But when you consider everything that we need to do and the fact that we actually operate the seventh biggest website in the world um, and understand that it's not just, it's just one of gazillion other projects and gazillion other initiatives, I think we, we counted and we got to almost 200 different initiatives or they're just astronomical numbers because even Wikipedia, right? It's not one, it's 300 different languages that need to be supported. And it's every version of Wikisource and every, it's a lot. It's just really a lot. And there are extensions and there are issues and you know. So technologically it's been challenging. The budget is not that big considering everything that we do and we just can't be the owners of everything. So what Mariana is doing for the past few years when, since she joined us 
is really be much more focused in the annual planning, first of all, anchoring it to movement strategy, but also then finding these key areas where we are focused on and trying to, to experiment and engage in new ways to, to do things. And I think education and I would say thematic work in general has been a, one of these places where we're trying to see if we can shift the own, most of the ownership besides you know, giving the infrastructure that Yael can talk more about probably, um, but keeping the infrastructure, the tech support, the tools, right, the things that we do best, the fundraising, things that we excel at, at the foundation, but see how, how it means to co-own with other entities in the movement, right? And see if we can have the community lead some of these things, which is why part of our discussion this weekend is, do we need an educational hub? Is this the right structure for us to liaise with the foundation to actually run education more efficiently? So it comes to that. It comes to roles and responsibilities and finding good owners to the missing bits that haven't been properly owned. And it's not happening only in education. Mariana took uh, last year two specific areas that she's looking into more specifically as case studies. One was Wiki Commons and the other was Wikidata as, as examples that we can explore together as a as, as a foundation to see what our impact can be to, to help um, figure some of the issues. Um, and in parallel, um, as was mentioned, much of it is related to tech and tech development. And so we just recently, pre, like consideringly recently, um, finally have a new CTPO, right? Uh, um, uh, Selena Deckelman, who joined us in August. It's not a long time. She's still entering the role and um, doing a lot, obviously, to change the structures to make it more efficient. So we can then further explore um, how we can best support the movement and how we can work with the different requests coming from the ground. And it's very difficult. It's very challenging. It's not easy. And again, we're here to try to improve the way that we've been doing things. Well, if I, if I hear you well, that means that it would move in the direction where some of the affiliates would actually specialize themselves in certain areas way more than they have been doing so far, right? If, if they can. So we if are they can, and if they want to. If, yes, if we are exploring exactly these options, we don't have the answers, we don't have the, it's a joint process of exploring who can take on specific responsibilities. Obviously, this is also connected to other efforts that are happening, including the MCDCs, um, Movement Charter, the, the Global Council, it's all kind of connected. It's an ecosystem of changes that we've been going through and it's all tying together. So uh, this is just to maybe stress that yes, the board is with leadership directing to a, a direction where we're having much more clarity about roles and responsibilities in the movement, which is critical, I think, and has been part of the reasons where we had issues and conflicts stemming from exactly that, and also jointly working on finding these solutions because it can't be the foundation telling the movement this is how it's going to work. This is not where we are at. We're really looking at working collaboratively to, to figure this out. In the spirit of working collaboratively, I'm going to stop us here because we are over time. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you so much to uh, our board members for their generosity in coming in at the last minute and, um, and taking these questions. And I will plug again the track in the Belgrade room. Please attend that. Please attend Manav's session later on the Movement Charter Drafting Committee and Movement Strategy and Education. 
these are spaces where we're trying to co-create um, this new reality, the new future that Shani was talking about. And we want your opinion and we want your perspective. This should not just be led by the people who have been talking about it for the last year. This should be led by all of us as a community. And this is the open invitation for you to participate. So please join us. Thank you. Thank you. And if you have additional questions, Rosie and Vicky and myself are here. Just catch us and talk to us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. OK. So thanks a lot. Um, our next session, um, I'll, I'm going to call Mohammed. OK. Um, he'll talk about the um, important uh, role of data collection and analysis in terms of improving quality of educational program, and also how can we use some techniques um, in terms of data collection. So assignments, um, feedback, and proper ways to an analyze them. So here you go. Yeah, thank you so much, but it's not presenting. OK, I'm sorry, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Mohammed from Palestine, um, a data scientist. I will be presenting how to enhance the quality of education programs and workshops through data collection and data analysis, or in general, by using the techniques of data science. So the presentation goals, we have five goals. The first one, I'm going to give you a comprehensive introduction about the field of data science. Then. Um, I'm going to speak about why it's important to implement the techniques of data science in enhancing the quality of our programs. Um, in the third uh, goal, I'm going to uh, highlight the key techniques that I personally use for collecting data. And in the fourth goal, I'm going to present the most important and the most essential tools for data analysis. And to be honest with you, you might find the first four goals a bit boring, but the most exciting goal is number five. I'm going to show real examples how I collected data, analyzed them to improve the quality of the education programs that I ran. So uh, data science, uh, I'm sure that uh, you know, you heard about this term before. Data science is a rapidly evolving discipline. It's gaining prominence as an emerging sciences Today and nowadays, in, in this data revolution that we are living in in this century, the successful organiza uh, organizations, foundations, and institutions are those who collect data, analyze them in order to modifi modify their services, their, their products, and their everything so that they can satisfy the needs of their audience. So it's actually an, not an easy discipline as um, I'm studying data science for two years and I'm still considering myself in the beginning. Anyone who gets into this science must have like statistical analysis, uh, background, programming, domain expertise, so that he or she can extract a meaningful insight from the data that she or he has. So uh, the first thing that I'm going to focus on is data as a collection of facts. Data is not numbers only. Data can be numbers, can be texts, images, videos, and so on. It's not numbers only. So um, we, can, we can leverage the techniques of data science in order to improve the quality of our programs. Like, for example, we can do customi customized training sessions based on participants' interests after we collect data about their interests. We can evaluate our educational resources effectiveness. And I think the people who, uh, who attended my lightning talk yesterday know exactly how I was successfully uh, uh, how I successfully evaluated the educational resources that I have in my program using the techniques of data science. And we can, like using the advanced disciplines of data science, like AI and NLB, artificial intelligence, and natural language processing, in order to fasten the responses um, to our participants or our students. I'm going to talk briefly right now about the methods that we use or I personally use. I think you know, these methods are too much enough. If you are a Wikipedian, you can use um, surveys, interviews, observations, or discussion groups, or you can find it in books under the name of focus groups. 
Um, this, these methods are so, so much enough if you are a Wikipedian and you want to collect data about your programs. So I'm going to talk about each of these in detail right now. So first, starting with surveys, as you can see, um, if you like, if, for example, if you have 600 students in your program, in one of my, my, gram, my programs in Iraq, I had 600 students, and it's really not possible to interview all of them. So I used surveys because they are, um, one of their pros is that they are so suitable for large amount of uh, participants, and they can be done remotely, and you can just open Google Forms and create your form and then send it to students, and they can easily uh, be analyzed. But um, the data that you get may be, may be inaccurate and it's limited by survey questions and you might have low response from students. Like for example, um, I sent the survey for 1,000 students last year, only 70 of them participated and the 70 are, majority of them are females and the majority of these females are literature students. So um, the, the sample was biased and I didn't use this data. Okay, um, interviews, uh, you can use them to, to get in-depth exploration of research questions. Uh, you can interview your participant and ask him like or her about more and more uh, clarification so, so that you can get rich qualitative data. Interviews, um, interviews are mainly to get qualitative data, not quantitative data and numbers, but qualitative data so that you can identify uh, where are the problems and address and address them and for sure you are flexible and you can ask any question you want to your uh, to your interviewee so um, these these are their problems and regarding their cons they are time consuming so for example if you have 10 participants you need to interview them one by one by one by one like if if anyone take, like if if you spend 15 minutes with each of them, so you need 150 minutes, and this is actually time consuming. And um, uh, for sure, um, there is a potential for bias, depends on the an interviewer like uh, mindset, and findings may not be easily generalizable because you are asking persons, you are asking them for individual opinions. Observations, um, you can get real-time data um, and insights about the engagement and learning from students and you can evaluate the teaching or training uh, techniques and you are, you are in the workshop, you are in the session so that you can evaluate easily and assess the effectiveness of the training or teaching method and you can evaluate the engagement ratio of the students as you are between them and in, among them. But for sure, observer, um, they have three cons, as you can see, uh, observer influence, difficulty capturing, and for sure they are time consuming. Finally, discussion groups, and I like this method too much, actually. Um, uh, as you can see, it's pros are facilitates group dynamics, um, varied pers you can get varied perspectives and varied opinions, and you can get so much qualitative data. And in the meantime, you can interview like, it's like a group interview. You can interview so many people in the meantime without interviewing them one by one. So um, it needs time, but its time is less than interview, individual interviews. So as you can see, its cons are, um, the, it requires skilled facilitation, dominant voices maybe overshadow others, difficult to ensure equal participation, and so on. But I can assure to you, if the one who's doing it is a skilled facilitator, he can tackle all these, he or she can tackle all these challenges. Um, great, so now I'm going to be talking about the most important data analysis tools. Um, first, I think all of you, use, or at least most of you, use the spreadsheets, especially Excel and Google Sheets. I highlighted the Google Sheets because they are free. Um, they are open and free and anyone can use them. Uh, also, programming languages are important for data analysis, like these three are a bit advanced, but it would be great if you have this in your, um, in your skills. Programming languages, Python, I personally use Python and SQL to analyze data. Also, data visualization tools like Tableau and Power BI. Tableau is available for free, and it's a, a very important and very powerful visualization tool. 
And we have some advanced programs that require the skills of coding and the programming like MATLAB. I personally use MATLAB, but if you are not a data scientist, you don't have to learn these three. Spreadsheets are more than enough if you are a Wikipedian. If you want to, con to conduct like advanced analysis, you can learn like programming languages. Okay, now coming to the most exciting part, um, which is I'm going to show you like real life examples of how I use data to enhance the quality of education programs. So I'm um, going to proceed with example number one. As you can see, the issue was engagement challenges and meetings and workshops. I think all of you uh, suffered from this issue um, in one of your training sessions or whatever. So we can resolve this issue easily by leveraging surveys to identify participants' interests. Remember that we are here to create an encyclopedia and we are here, all of us are volunteers. So it's important to address the audience interests in order to uh, make them engaged with you. Um, so this is a group photo from, from one of the wiki data sessions that I held in my university like four years ago. So I, I conducted a pre-survey to in order to like identify the audience interest. I want to know what, what do you want to learn from Wikidata? Why are you here and all these things so that I can modify the content of the session to satisfy their needs. So it's really important to conduct a pre-survey and a post-survey to evaluate to what degree you were successful in addressing the challenges that uh, uh, your, your participants uh, wanted to know about. So um, in, in surveys, this is actually my rule, do not rely on friends and do not rely on enemies because friends will be so supportive even, even if you did like, um, even if your workshop was not that high quality, they will be always supportive to you. So don't take their opinions in consideration. And your enemies, whatever you did, they will, uh, they will give you like negative uh, opinions. So do not consider their opinions Yeah, I mean in surveys only. <laughs> okay, now proceeding with example number two. The problem was this engagement with the group messages among participants. So the, the resolution was employing automation. Automation is one of the most important field of data science in order to deliver personalized messages. As you can see, as you can see, this is the code that I wrote. Um, like you can see if the gender is male, send this message and consider to change the name. If the gender is female, um, send this message and consider to change the name. The messages are so similar as you can see, but there are some differences because the Arabic language, like the formation for males is different a bit than the formation of females. Like for example, here's takunu for males and takuni for females and be careful to Okay, um, as you can see here, it's takunu and here is takuni because there is different in Arabic language formation. So it's really important you need to care about these tiny things because if you get caught while sending autom automated message, that would be so bad. Students will feel like, oh, it's an automated message and I will not uh, reply to it. It's like any other message. And, but if they felt like you are treating them uh, like you are treating them specially, يعني, you are caring about them, you are sending them personalized message like, hi, how are you? How was, you, how was the session? Please tell me your feedback. They will care much more than if it was like a group message. Yeah. So proceeding with example number three, uh, most of my students told me that I talk too much during the sessions, so I needed to solve this problem. Uh, so the first thing I did, I, I sent them a survey, a post, uh, sorry, a pre-survey, so that I can identify, identify their interests, and I modified the content of the workshop so that I can only like address their interests and. I wanted like something to measure to what degree I was successful in decreasing my TTT, which is teaching, uh, trainer teaching time. So I implemented a good measure to assess um, the, solu this, uh, the solution, which is simply analyzing uh, chat, uh, Zoom chat um, uh, engagements. As you can see, this is the time frame. 
I think can scroll up. Okay. <laughs> this slide? No, no, this one. Okay, I can change. Mm -hmm. um, as you can see, this is the time frame here. This is the time frame here, and this is like the engagements where students, like the messages that were sent on the chat. So as you can see, this is the chat frequency where one minute, and um, at the beginning, they were not sending anything because we are, they were just coming to the session. And after that, as you can see, as I asked them if my voice is clear, so they sent too much message. And after that, I, I explained something to them, and I asked them if they have any questions. They asked the questions, as you can see. After that, I explained another thing and asked if you have any questions, look at here. I, they had too much questions. What does that mean? This means that the, um, the educational material here is not sufficient. I, I, couldn't, I was not able to address all uh, their um, like challenges. So I need to modify this educational material to make sure that I at least answer most of their questions. Okay. Oh. So after that, I explained another thing. They asked questions. I explained. They asked. As you can see, they didn't ask too much questions here. Not like this, as you can see. So what does that mean? This means that I was able to address most of their questions in this uh, in this part of the lecture, and so on. So this analysis is so important to identify in which part you were successful and in which part you were unsuccessful. Getting too much questions is not, uh, or to getting too much engagements is not something good. Getting, getting like a lower number of uh, questions is also not something good because this is this might be an indication that they are not engaged with you. They are not they are not enjoying the lecture or they are not focusing with you at all. So you have to ensure that you are in the middle. Okay, as you can see, this is the table, uh, translation uh, one, translation two, translation three. So I asked the students, what is the most, uh, the most um, like session that you liked in our program? They all said, uh, session number two, and as you can see, why did the, why did they like session number two? They had the large number of engagements, like engagements where attendance ratio was 19.6. This is a high, this is the highest number, because in this um, in this lecture I didn't speak too much. I allowed them to engage. I asked I allowed them to ask so many questions, and as you can see, we had 75 students, and the number of engagements, the number of messages that they sent in the Zoom chat was 1,470. And if we divided this by this, we can get 19.6. But as you can see in editing Wikipedia number one, like I only received two. two 204 questions and their editing quality. This is, if you remember the yesterday's um, lightning talk of mine, this was actually too bad because their editing quality was too bad. So I was not successful in delivering uh, what I need to deliver in this workshop. So I can, you can see here according to numbers, according to, according to data that we had problems in the editing Wikipedia sessions. Is that clear? Okay, so Example number four, lack of enthusiasm among participants for translation or editing tasks. So um, for people who attended my session about Bitscan yesterday, I think they can uh, uh, know better how I resolved this issue. I used Bitscan to generate lists of articles that needs to be expanded or translated. And I utilize, utilize the mass views tool to sort these articles based on view count. As you can see, um, I had some uh, some students who are specialized in medicine, and they wanted uh, they wanted like medical articles to participate in. So I I extracted so many uh, so many of the medical articles, and I sorted them by daily average. And I gave the students this article to work, and I told them, if you worked in this article, you will be benefiting more than 1,000 individual per day. So he get, so he got excited, and he like contributed um, in high quality to this article. So numbers are so important to motivate and uh, like keep the um, students much engaged with your workshop and the editing tasks. 
And I think we all have this issue of repetitive questions and we, we, we always receive the same questions and we always answer the same answers. So we can, we can resolve this by using an advanced, uh, like advanced part of data science, which is, as I said in the first uh, slide, strong natural language processing and artificial intelligence capabilities. And I asked ChatGPT, actually, as you can see, so many questions that are related to Wikipedia. So, for example, explain to me step by step, how can I add a reference to an article? And its answer was actually so great. So we can, like, for example, um, this is a proposal, like a cooperation between Wiki Wikimedia Foundation and OpenAI Institute, so that they can create something li like, it's called WikiGPT. <laughs> this, is, this is from Florence. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, WikiGBT in order to help the volunteers and address the issues that uh, the newcomers are suffering from. So example number six was covered in the lightning talk yesterday. So, um, so for, the, for people who didn't attend my lightning talk yesterday, sadly you will not be able to understand this graph. I want you to regret too much. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, now we will go to our next session, Lightning Talks Part 4. I'm going to invite you, Hadnan um, Gorana, who will be presenting um, in the name of justice and her, hers, um, Brahim, uh, Armen, uh, Rosie, and uh, Mohammed again. Um, he, you can sit in the front, front rows, so we will just change your presentations, who has one. You'll have three minutes per session. Um, yeah, that's it. So first, Hanan. Here you go. <gasps> Here you go. Do you want to use this or this? This one is fine. Mm -hmm. Well, um, hello again. I'm Hernan from Wikimedia Colombia, and today I'm going to talk to you about the Wikimedia Education Program adapting to a peace building context in Colombia. So, what is a peace building context? It's a transition scenario. In November 2016, the Colombian government signed a peace agreement with the FARC guerrillas, the oldest guerrilla in the continent, that after 56 years of war left uh, very uh, deeply damaging impacts in, in the context. More than 7 million displaced foremans, which means families had to run from their homes. More than 16,000 children recruited. And this means a lot of uh, struggles for the educational context. So there are national challenges after this war in this post-conflict scenario. And of course, the strate strategic plan of Wikimedia Foundation in Colombia uh, wanted to uh, advise the social and digital breaches because three out of ten persons in scholar ages didn't go to school between 19 and 21, even though it's mandatory. There's still the myths and taboos about the uses of Wikipedia and, of course, the resources appropriation, digital tools and methodologies require enlargening our network. But we wanted to focus a little more to understand how to connect a peace-building approach into this uh, program. So we started asking ourselves, which, which piece are we talking about? There is this official piece that was signed by the government with the guerrillas that built an infrastructure that needs to implement these accords. So we want to approach this official peace building infrastructure and strengthen it through the tools that we have in the Wikimedia ecosystem. But also there were uh, territories where this uh, official piece didn't uh, arrive. Uh, and this is the everyday peace building we're talking here. This is the people that day by day struggle with the troubles and are the experts in experience that need to uh, dialogue with the expert, experts in experimentation, which could be us as mediators of these platforms. Because when this official peace doesn't arrive to the territories, no one crosses hands. There's still this optimism and this uh, volunteer to, for, to to work you know, towards uh, like better conditions and dignified life. So Wikimedia Colombia wants to walk side by side with this community. So 
the two approaches, the official piece and the everyday piece, have to uh, be part of our program. And, and we wanted to do it through three approaches that we, we resume here. The do no harm approach. So every time we do an activity, we want to left installed capacities in, in, in these uh, communities. The gender approach, uh, diminishing the breaches between uh, gender representation in, in the educational context and what is called the affective action research, which actually is our goal in research is not to create papers, but to promote the creation of learning communities. And uh, this could incise positively in the structural violences, uh, a positive impact through access to information and tools to give voice to these people that have been historically excluded from the knowledge production circuits. So that's it, we invite you to uh, uh, follow us in this <laughs> dream of, of using the Wikimedia ecosystem towards uh, a peace building. Thank you. Gorana. Thank you very much. Uh, hello everyone, I am Gorana Gomirac, I am GLA manager at Wikimedia Serbia, but also a license for uh, CE region in Let's Connect program. So uh, today I will tell you a little bit more about the program. I was supposed to have this session with Justice from Ghana, our dear colleague, but unfortunately he was not able to come. So big kudos to, to him and to the rest of the Let's Connect team. So let's go. So what is Let's Connect? Let's Connect is a peer learning program that was founded by Wikimedia Foundation last year. It is supported by Wikimedia Foundation and it is led by community, which I will explain later. So uh, basically this is a safe space for all of us to learn, to share experience, to share knowledge, to just communicate, to connect, to learn from each other. So um, this is like an online space where we can ask questions, talk about mistakes we made, because I think uh, making mistakes is a very good way actually to learn. So why not learning from others' mistakes? So yeah, uh, this is a very safe space for learning. And purpose is to develop skills in various, um, various fields. So, uh, what I said, it's community-led and foundation-supported. Um, members of staff of Wikimedia Foundation are members of Let's Connect working groups, but uh, community all around the world, as you can see, um, the dot um, next to CU region, but we have people, our team members from all around the world, which is very important because we can see different perspective. Uh, we can see like some activities that are led differently in different parts of the world and we can really learn how to implement something in maybe our region or how to um, maybe improve something or share our thoughts and our experiences. So uh, we have uh, like we, we can take a look at, my, uh, at our colleagues and uh, members of Let's Connect working group. So how does it work, actually? Uh, we have three ways of organizing activities. Uh, first of all, we have learning clinics, which is very important. And this is like an um, hour and a half or two hour long learning session. Uh, it is organized uh, around different topics. So we are really trying to cover what is important, what is uh, interesting maybe at the moment for communities all around the world. Um, it uh, takes um, experienced Wikimedians or experts to share their experience around some topic and uh, we are organizing like panel discussions, workshops, breakout rooms on Zoom, and people are joining from all around the world. We have regional learning clinics, but uh, most of them are globally uh, organized. We have one-on-one -on -one connections. That means that if there is a need, we are connecting people from all around the world so you can approach us and tell us, for example, we need support in grant proposal and we will connect you with someone who has experience in that and who can help you uh, in um, grant proposing process. So you can always approach us with some need and we will do everything we can to uh, respond to it. 
Uh, the last one is connection to other spaces. What does it mean? If there is some other learning session or training or workshop and we know about it, we will share it with our community. So you're always aware on what to do uh, and when it is happening and when you can learn about that. So this is, this is the list of some skills you can achieve. But uh, as I said, we are organizing this around various topics. Uh, some of them are, as I said, grant proposal writing, uh, project management, organizational planning, uh, maybe how to join some important Wikimedian competition or activity. So we are really trying to cover um, many topics we can. And if there is a need and we see it, we will organize around that. But if you have anything you would like to talk more about, please let us know. Uh, those are some numbers that we wanted to show around Let's Connect. So, for example, we had more than 600 participants uh, in our learning clinics, which is very important. 4.2 is our average uh, score on a scale of 1 to 5 of how, uh, on, uh, how much our participants are satisfied. So we are always trying to learn and to be better. And like the whole point is to make um, like a um, universal safe space for us to learn. Uh, so uh, today and tomorrow, and you can always approach us with ways on how we can be better, how we can um, and sensitive ad wiki communities to participate to Let's Connect. So as we were all talking throughout this conference, it's very important to share experience, to share knowledge. We can share that even after this conference through Let's Connect. Uh, you can scan this code if you want to register to be part of Let's Connect. You can always write us. You can visit our page on Meta to see uh, more details about that. You have our email, you have my email, so you can always uh, write us to know more about that. And thank you very much. I hope we can connect. Thank you, Gorana. And now I'll invite Brahim for his session. Yeah, you can, you can, uh, sorry, I just have to refresh this table. <laughs> okay, you can watch this. <laughs> No, no, if you have. Gogi? Yeah. But the links are not updated for some reason. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, you can also use this one. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hi again. Uh, I'm Brahim Faraji, uh, coordinator of, educator, uh, of education program with the Moroccan Users Group. So uh, the story of reading Wikipedia in the classroom uh, started in uh, 2020, and it was. Uh, in context of uh, pilot projects with uh, Philippines and Bolivia. And uh, uh, how, it, how it started, uh, it, it started with like mathematics or statistics. So imagine all teacher career, they work for 30 or 40 years. So if we can count the number of students that uh, learn uh, for each uh, teacher uh, during 30 years, we can find a thousand of uh, students for each teacher. So our focus uh, or our target was the teacher because the impact uh, 
of the project will be uh, so big. So yeah, uh, the first challenge, uh, challenge that we had, it was uh, the perception, the negative perception of Wikipedia. So what we did as action, so is talking about Wikipedia through uh, social media, through uh, Facebook groups and uh, WhatsApp groups uh, of teachers. And it, you can imagine all efforts that we had to convince a uh, teacher about using Wikipedia in the classroom. Uh, second thing, it was contacting uh, press media uh, to, uh, uh, to show the value of the movement and the impact of uh, using Wikipedia as a pedagogical tool inside the school. Uh, the second uh, challenge that we had, uh, okay, oops, sorry. That just uh, an example of uh, many article was uh, talking about uh, the projects in Morocco. Uh, that for communication. Uh, second challenge that we had, it was COVID. So COVID, you know, all schools were closed. So people or teacher, especially. Uh, weren't prepared to use other uh, way to teach. So uh, they don't have any other platform, online platform, uh, to connect with st students. So uh, actually they, was, uh, they were using uh, WhatsApp and uh, Facebook to continue teaching, imagine that. So uh, the project was uh, to convince teacher to subscribe or do registration to uh, our training, it was so hard because it was like another effort that teachers should doing in parallel with uh, training uh, through uh, social media. So the first edition started with 100 teacher and we had in the end 27 graduate teacher but then we did uh, like a study research or evaluation to, uh, to see uh, uh, what's wrong, what we can do uh, for uh, the first uh, edition. It was the third uh, challenge, that's the administration uh, process. So to get partnership with uh, schools, you have to go with uh, direction of partnership in Rabat, and that uh, took a lot a lot of time and effort. Then uh, the action that we had, so looking for uh, another partner. Partner. It was uh, an association that called uh, Network of Lecture in Morocco. So it facilitates uh, the, uh, the contact with uh, government, with schools. And why? Because, uh, as you know, the Moroccan User Group doesn't have a legal statute in Morocco. So it can have problem to deal with government or administration. So the partnership with uh, this association uh, facilitates uh, communication with, uh, with administration and resolve all technical uh, process. So the second edition, we receive uh, 700 uh, registration from teachers. And it was so amazing that we get that result. And as you see, I, as comparison between uh, 20 and 22, and that uh, we start with 100 and we, uh, we go directly to 786. And the first and the second edition, the first edition was fully online uh, through Facebook because Facebook is used by all teachers, and it was easy to uh, that they can uh, follow up through Facebook. The second edition, uh, we continue uh, with uh, Facebook. Uh, that means online uh, training, but in the end, we tried another uh, thing. It was a boot camp. So uh, we invite uh, 40 
uh, 40 teachers, 20 who were already involved in training, and the second 20, uh, they didn't have any idea about the project or Wikipedia. So it was like just experimenting uh, this uh, way of training. Then, uh, when those teachers come back to their office, to their, uh, to their schools, they start talking about the experience. Okay, one minute. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the impact uh, that we had after that, we, re we start to receive from many directorate invitation to come and do training for their teachers from all region of Morocco, especially the north. And uh, we didn't expect uh, expected that. And second thing, uh, as you see here, uh, the teacher who were uh, interested by the uh, project was from primary schools. And that was uh, first surprise for us. In, and second and th uh, third uh, discipline, it was Arabic and Islamic uh, education. Because uh, we didn't expect that, that religion uh, uh, against education. So now <laughs> well, we have that perception that uh, changed or corrected. So uh, that's some training, uh, some indicator. Uh, we can uh, share that and you will find that in the annual uh, report uh, of uh, our user group. We can share that in the end. Uh, for uh, the third edition, we will start it the next uh, week and we receive uh, 876 uh, demand for the third edition. And what is amazing in this uh, edition that we will use EDX platform, uh, WikiLearns. So it's uh, the first time that uh, I think uh, one user group in Arab world uh, will use EDX platform for training, uh, online training. And uh, we cross fingers. Uh, we keep watching uh, this experience and we will share with you uh, the result in the end uh, after that uh, edition uh, will finish. And we faced some challenges for edX with edX platform because uh, coming from English to Arabic, uh, we get uh, some uh, technical issues. Uh, so let's keep praying for uh, that experience, new experience for our user group. So yeah, I think uh, time is uh, over. <laughs> I'm sorry to, but uh, we are here if, uh, if anyone wants more information uh, about our experience. Okay. Thank you. And I will call, call Adamen. Yeah, okay, it's okay. Uh, hello again, everyone. My name is Armen Mirzoyan. I'm from Armenia. I'm a former staff member of Wikimedia Armenia, and now I work for uh, HATC, which is the leading investigative journalism portal in uh, our region, in Southern Caucasus. And I just yeah. zoomed. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, I want to talk about a project uh, which is about the textual content of Wikipedia, uh, sorry, visual content of Wikipedia. Uh, in these years, uh, Armenian Wikipedia has been one of the dynamically developing Wikipedias in Eastern Europe and uh, Southern Caucasus. For years, a lot of events, trainings, or projects were initiated to improve the 
textual content of uh, Armenia Wikipedia. Even the number of articles increase because of the translation from other language Wikipedias, especially in Armenian, it is Russian and English. But the visual content of the articles were mainly stayed unimproved. And even uh, when they translated it from Russian or uh, English, they took the uh, visuals from there and they uh, even uh, haven't uh, translated uh, uh, textual content of that uh, visuals. So we're, we were thinking about that enriching uh, Wikipedia with quality visuals may attract uh, people to spend more time in Wikipedia to obtain, contribute and also share knowledge from there. So the investigative journalist NGO initiated Wikigraphers visualizing open knowledge project with the financial assistance of Wikimedia Foundation Alliances Fund. And during the implementation of this project, we used learning by doing method. What it means, uh, what and what we did, we uh, announced an open call and we chose 20 participants to participate in this project from many spheres. And uh, we started an educational program, uh, an eight months long program during which they studied illustrative or visual skills. And then they used that skills for creating visuals for Wikipedia articles based on the information which is in that articles. So that, uh, the educational process is consists of, uh, of four main subjects. First of all, it's wiki ideology and wiki editing. Uh, during this course, the participants learn about Wikimedia movement, its values, wiki markup, wiki editing, and everything which is connected with wiki. The second one is creation of data-driven infographics. You know, there are a lot of data in net, also in Wikipedia. So the participants, which are both active Wikipedians and new, uh, new participants who do their first steps in Wiki, Wikimedia movement, they started how to find, collect, and also how to filter data from the, uh, from the reliable sources. And after that, how to create infographics for that articles based on the information, based on that data. The third one is illustration and animation. Uh, they learn how to create images, uh, graphical images and uh, motion uh, based also on the information. And the emphasized is placed on the objects which mainly cannot be photographed, such as chemical, ch chemical reactions or physical phenomena and etc. And the fourth one, uh, oh, I skipped that slide, sorry. And the fourth one is GIS mapping. Uh, they learned uh, how to use QGIS. They put the GIS information in the GIS open source software. And through the help of that software, they created maps for Wikipedia uh, articles. One of the main uh, up, uh, aspects of our project was the connection between newcomers and active Wikipedians. For enriching this part of the projects, we organized, we implemented hackathons, editathons, meetings with them, uh, with the active Wikipedians, and they together uh, started to create articles and visuals for that articles. So uh, this is the main direction of our activities and Wikimedia projects. It is the visualiz visualization of Wikipedia articles and Wikimedia projects at all. And we will continue to work on this direction. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and also, if you have any question about the educational process, about the program, you can just uh, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Armin, so much. And I'm going to call <coughs> Rosie to join us. And um, just keep in mind the time, please, um, because we <laughs> you all have to get to the lunch. Here you go. You can use this one as well. Hi, everybody. I'm Rosie Stevenson Goodnight. And some of you may know me as a prolific editor on English Wikipedia since 2007. Although I wear some other hats, and I'm going to talk today about one of them. My experience as a Wikipedia visiting scholar at Northeastern University, Boston, Massachusetts. 
The background of how I got involved with that is that a group of people started creating articles about women in the month of March, starting in about 2011. And at the same time, someone created a project called Wiki Project Women's History. The next year, 2012, March, Women's History Month, more people created more biographies about women, and someone created Wiki Project Women Artists. The next year, 2013, same thing, more and more people creating biographies in the month of March, Women's History Month, and Women Sci Wiki Project Women Scientists was created. In 2014, I created Wiki Project Women Writers. It started off with about a thousand articles, mostly biographies, but there were a few articles about women's work. So think like the novels, the, uh, their poems, maybe their essays. In the meantime, the uh, Wiki Education Foundation based in San Francisco, uh, I see Frank there in the back, and you have all met Liana now numerous times, um, developed a program called the Wikipedia Visiting Scholar Program, where it connects experienced Wikipedians with academic institutions to improve Wikipedia. This is a US or Canada-based Wikipedian who wants to be a volunteer. It's not a paid position, no compensation. And they have specific expertise in a particular area. And there's a university who wants to have a Wikipedian who comes in and uses its resources to create articles on Wikipedia. In 20, March 2017, I became one of those Wikipedia visiting scholars. And in particular, it was at Northeastern University in creating and improving Wikipedia articles on pre-20th century women writers and their works and the book trade, and also women in education and women and as readers. You can see the metrics there of how many um, articles I've created or improved. And there's a link um, to the page where I keep track of those statistics. As you might imagine, I also use a dashboard. Here's a click of that. I expanded the project in 2019. And what I did is I took the API of a part of Northeastern University's uh, Women's uh, Writers Project called the Women Writers in Review Initiative. The Women Writers in Review uh, Initiative is a collection of 18th and 19th century reviews, publication notices, literary histories, and other texts that you would find in the journals that were available in that day that reviewed the works that women had written. And by that, I'm talking about, again, not just necessarily the, the novels they wrote, the poems they wrote, the essays they wrote, but it might also include something about um, a school that they founded that had a particular emphasis where it was women attended the school and maybe women learned um, more about the writing trade. And it also included things like women as publishers, women as bookbinders, women as booksellers, so broadly construed. 81 authors, 232 works, 138 periodicals, 601 reviews. This is, um, you can see my methodology in that link on Wikidata. It's a work in progress. He's not here today, but I want to give a shout out to, he happens to now be a new trustee, Mike Peel, who helped me with some of this um, Wikidata work bringing in the API. A uh, final word here that my work also includes efforts on Wikimedia Commons. Often I will, um, if I've written the article about this woman, I will search for an image about her. And I've learned how to be a pretty good researcher. I found a, a lot of images of these women and I make sure then that I upload them to Wikimedia Commons, but not just them. Because if I find their photo in a um, periodical and there are other photos of other women, those become fodder for me for the next article that I'm going to write. And I upload their images in Wikimedia Commons too. I've enjoyed sharing with you this information about my Wikipedia Visiting Scholar position. 
Um, my, uh, my ability to continue the work has been renewed for another year, so I'm happy about that. And I'd be really happy to know if there's anyone else, either in this audience or who's listening to this recorded session, who's also doing this kind of work at some other institution, so we can maybe learn from each other, um, share some strategies, maybe share some methodology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosie. And last in this session, but not, but not the least, uh, Mohamed again. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hi again. So now I will be talking about Wikipedia education program in Palestine, my country. I will be talking about the editions, the results, the challenges that we face, and the opportunities that we have. So as you can see, uh, these photos are from the first edition of Wikipedia education program in Palestine. It was launched by uh, our, our well-known Wikimedian, Farah Mustaklim, who was like a member of the uh, AFCOM group. And this edition was in 2015. So the first edition of this program was in 2015 in Birzeit University in Ramallah. And these are some photos from the ceremony. This is the group photo of the same ceremony. So after that, I and Farah, and you can see at the left, uh, Bara Zamara, she's a well-known editor too. She participated in so many conferences, including Wikimania. So he met us and he suggested us to launch an, a new edition of Wikipedia education program in our cities. So uh, after that, we launched the first edition of Wikipedia education program in Nablus at the Najah National University. So this is from uh, the ceremony and that was in 2018. And this is another edition of the same program that was in 2018 too, in the same university. So after that we extended, yani we went to Jerusalem University and we uh, launched a new edition of this program there. And as you can see, these are some photos of the ceremony. Farah is always there. So in one of uh, our ceremonies, we had like a word from Jimmy Wells, the founder of Wikipedia, as you can see. That was at Anajah National University in Nablus. So after that, we extended more. And my colleagues, uh, Tala, Bara, Sami, Ala, by the way, Ala, I think some of you know Ala, he was the Wikimedian of the year in 2021. He's Palestinian and he's the Wikimedian of the Year in 2021, uh, the one with black uh, t-shirt. And Nadine Kottena, they launched the first edition of this program in their city, which is Hebron. And as you can see, this, is, this photo is from of, uh, one of the ceremonies. They launched six editions so far, and they are, um, they are doing continuous efforts to launch new and new editions in various universities in the same city. All of these photos are in Hebron. So this is uh, uh, the most uh, well-known Palestinian dessert, which is kunafa, and it's written there Wikimedia, Wikimedia, but in Arabic. So our achievements, uh, in five years, we were able to train uh, more than 800 students. Most of them are university students and they successfully contributed to more than 2,000 articles on the Arabic Wikipedia. Most of them are featured and good articles, and they successfully uploaded more than 3,000 photos for the Palestinian regions on Wikimedia Commons. 
Uh, we actually face so many challenges in Palestine. Um, the most important one is the lack of a volunteering culture. Um, it's really hard to get more and more and attract more and more uh, participants and recruit new volunteers because we live in an unstable, unstable area. Palestinians um, are suffering from political, uh, social, economic challenges and um, like they have so much important priorities than volunteering in a Wikipedia. Um, also, um, so many active Wikipedians are struggling to maintain their involvement and sustain their contribution to the education programs because they have so much responsibilities and work commitments. And finally, we are suffering from transportation hurdles, like in five or even seven years, we only met twice. And this is because there are so many checkpoints by the occupation between the Palestinian cities, and this is actually uh, co yani costing us too much inspection time. Like, if you want to move between too much two cities, you will uh, at least spend two hours in the inspection time, even if they are too close. Uh, Despite all these challenges, we are determined to continue our work in enhancing and promoting and launching new editions of the education program. And we kindly, as, as my colleague Musab said, we kindly ask the foundation to, um, to respond much faster to our grant proposals and help us to find sustainable solutions in order to sustain the editions of Wikipedia education program in Palestine. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you for your presentations and your lighting talks. And now I'll invite you to the lunch. Uh, you can use the restaurant and uh, you can go back um, uh, at 2. We are starting our sessions at 2.
but hi everyone. Uh, I think it's the second day, so most of you have met me by now. But if not, I'm Sailesh Patnaik. I'm a program officer with the education team at the Wikimedia Foundation. I've been in the movement for the last 12 years doing education, I think from the last eight to 10 years, if roughly, you know. But today I'm very excited for this particular thing that I'm going to talk about, or we are going to talk about, which is the EduWiki Outreach Collaborators. But before starting my session, I want to give like an example, you know, like a person, I want to share a personal experience. So when I was a, when I was a movement organizer myself, it was very difficult for me at that time to find support. Yes, I would come to the international conferences, I would hear everything, you know, like all the experiences that people have learned from something. But it was difficult for me to like put it in my context or, you know, like think of like how would this happen? There is a global model, but how could this work in the work that I try to do? And in this term, you know, in this kind of a thing, it really helps when you have like a regional support. You have someone who, who, be, who, who understand your context, who understand your local challenges, who understand the opportunities, and is a friend in need, I would say, yeah. Who, who we can like collaborate with, who we can work with, you know, to support you in that. How many of you here know about like peer support? Great. Great, so today we are going to talk about peer support with the EduWiki Outreach Collaborators. So peer support is something like when someone who understand your context, you understand you, like what, like some expertise about your region, or about the work that you do, and provide support to like work together, collaborate together. So EduWiki Outreach Collaborators is, uh, is a peer support network within the education community where the leaders from the education community come together to create or support programs for the community, from the community, by the community. So we have structured this peer support network into three groups. Uh, the three groups are of like community specialists, newsletter, and documentation specialists. So it's not like everything, everywhere, all at once. So it has been distributed so that we could not or we should not like overwhelm one person with like, oh, you have to do like everything that is available or you have to support everything with the community. Because at the end of the day, this is also like a volunteer contribution. So we won't appreciate the work, the support that you are providing to the community, to the, to the volunteers in your region. So the community specialists are more of like a regional role where each community has, uh, each region has have their own community specialist. We were meeting uh, our, speakers or our panelists today and this is not a panel but more of like a conversation hour and you will hear more from them then we have the newsletter team so i know it's been trending since yesterday about the newsletter and bukola gave an amazing speech at the end she did an amazing workshop before that so that's the amazing newsletter team we have and then we have the documentation specialist so one of the thing that we struggle as a community is that we we do a lot of things. It's not like we do not, we do a lot of things, but how do we disseminate that information? We walk in a free knowledge movement where the goal of the movement is to like, you know, sp spread the knowledge, disseminate the knowledge. But in terms of the work that we do, it's very hard to like find, you know, like what exactly is Wikimedia Indonesia doing? Do I know if I'm in India, the work that Wikimedia Indonesia is doing? Do I know what is Wikimedia Serbia is doing if I'm based in India? So it also helps like the, the documentation specialist is a group that is helping us to understand like how can we make like the regional documentation better? How can it be easily available, easily searchable? And we are still like trying to figure out how is this possible? Is this meta, or is it better is the best place to do it? But we have created like some regional spaces on meta to make this happen. Uh, so this peer support group has been with the movement from the last two years. This is the second cohort of the EduWiki Outreach Collaborators. We have 24 participants from 14 different countries. This is where they're all based in. Oh, it's just disappeared. Okay, fine. So uh, we have like community members, 
not just community members. This, this is a peer support ne network and also in a way that there are staff from affiliates who are also part of this uh, Eduwiki Outreach Collaborators. We have Nebosha, who's a Wiki community manager from Wikimedia Serbia. We have Alejandro Reyes, who's an education manager from Wikimedia Mexico. So we also have like, it's a, it's a mix of like staff and volunteers working together to help the education community, you know, to find that support and collaborate with each other. Uh, this is the last cohort. Uh, it says current members, but we are still trying to figure out like where does this Edwiki Outreach Collaborator stand? Uh, so we did some evaluation. Today we will be talking about that. And we have engaged with like 244 participants in 15, 13 different regional meetings. Uh, so it's very regional focused meetings. And even in the regional meetings for the first time, I met someone like from Cyprus, from Australia. Like Australia is so close to my country, but it, I, I've never worked with like an Australian community member who does work in education. But because of the regional meetings, I met like folks from these regions to like, you know, when they came out and they shared their work with us and they looked for opportunities. Oh, this is like Wikimedia Indonesia is doing. Maybe this is something that we can also replicate in our context. Uh, we have published like wonderful 20 education newsletter with 100 plus submissions. Thanks to Bukola, Ankan, Anthony and uh, Joni. Uh, and we're also working to make the regional documentation practices more visible. Uh, this has been some testimonials from the uh, participants who have been here uh, with us. Uh, there has been like a bigger regional peer support work happening. So you can see it's, uh, there's two groups right now. Uh, we don't have that for like other reasons, but for the Middle East and North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, they are like hundred something members in two groups. They talk, they talk to each other, they share resources, uh, they plan things together. So this was Eduwiki Outreach Collaborators. And I'm going to invite my friends and partners in crime uh, Nebosha and Bukola to join me for a conversation time and we will go on a deep dive into this regional approach towards like Edgewiki network and what we have learned, what we have experienced. Uh, Bukola and Nebosha, do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm Neboj Sharatkovic, Education Program Manager at um, Wikimedia Serbia. And um, I've been in uh, this uh, position from, um, for seven years already, almost seven years. And um, uh, I have this experience working with uh, Silas on this project and, and I'm happy to be here with you today to share my experience. Okay, um, hi everyone. My name is Bukola James, and I've been part of this uh, peer network since 2021. And yes, it's been a good um, network of um, leaders coming together to share insights and also like provide supports for um, educational leaders within their network. So I'm from Nigeria, and I'm also a member of the EduWiki Africa uh, Network. So happy to be here, and thank you. Thanks, Bukola. And it's, it's interesting also to see like how the members of the like who, the Ruby, who uh, is our community specialist for Sub-Saharan Africa, after being part of the EOC or the HBK Outreach Collaborators, she started uh, podcasts. So now you have like stories from like African community members that you can listen to and get inspired and understand their context, understand the work they're doing regionally and how inspiring it is. But I actually want to start with you like to know more about your experiences. Uh, Nebosha, you mentioned that you have been with this cohort, I think since the pilot we started like two years back. How has been your experience and Bukola, you are relatively new, I, you know, just one year. Yeah. So what has been your experiences being part of a peer support network? Um, yeah, for Wikimedia Serbia, it was, um, let's say, a logical step because um, we started our education program in 2005. Uh, so quite a long time ago, 
And um, this opportunity was important for us because we wanted to um, set it up at a um, higher level uh, and to share our experience with, with the, the whole region uh, and the rest of the world. The world. So um, uh, my experience personally um, was really good because uh, the whole process was very simple. I felt personally uh, like uh, guided through the whole process. And um, I definitely um, learned a lot um, through this project for the last two years. So um, it was really great. And I would also like to thank you for, for coordinating everything and for being there um, for us. OK. Um, so for me, I would say it's a great learning experience and an opportunity to like enhance my communication skill because uh, we discovered that there was a need for um, educational leaders, people who have been doing exciting projects and activities to like share their projects with other people who would also like want to learn from uh, the best practices from some of the projects that they've implemented. But then there was no documentation, there was no like um, something that could like provide a guide aside for maybe the final reports, the rights after the projects and the likes. So we thought that it would be best to also like um, have a space where they could share uh, some of their experience in form of a, a, a podcast and also like um, write about their activities. So it's not just about documenting for reporting sake, but also like having people learn more about the project. So uh, for me, it's a, it's a great learning experience and also like an opportunity uh, to engage many people. And uh, I think uh, being part of the e-work has also like helped me uh, better understand how we can like um, amplify our voices in terms of um, helping people learn more about what uh, educational leaders are doing in their various community. And I think it's a great one and it's, it's, it's a good one because uh, having to like have this podcast, have a, a, a place where they could share their story. And uh, I see that it's also kind of provide a lot of uh, opportunity for people outside of the wiki education space to also learn from what we do. So. I think it's it's been great and yeah that's yeah thanks for sharing that perspective Bukola. I'm I'm also like interested to know that you're telling a, a bit about the impact that it has created on you. Yeah. Do you have like any experience or someone you know like sharing that the impact that it has happened to them like being like the support that we have provided through the as an edu educ outreach collaborator member? Okay, yes. Um so uh before I think before 2021, uh, the community, the African, the EduWiki community in Africa have been really doing a lot of programs and activity. But like most of them were not uh, familiar with the newsletter. Uh, like they do not know that there was an existing network that could like provide uh, support for them in terms of mentorship and also like um, guide them through some of the programs. Maybe they needed um, advice or like they need someone to just um, guide, um, assist them during implementation or like provide a guideline on how to go about the planning for their projects and all that. But then uh, I have got a lot of people reaching out to me, telling me that, oh, Buki, I would like to feature my uh, story or I would like to feature what I do in the education newsletter. And it makes me happy because I know, uh, I feel like, yes, we are really achieving uh, something at the end of the day because we get people who want to reach out to us, who want to showcase their projects. So it's, it's, a, it's a good one. And I think I've um, had a lot of engagements with people uh, in terms of like they want to learn how to um, submit their activities, they want their their project to be featured in the newsletter and all that. So, and yes, it, um, there was some time we even had to like 
organize online training to guide them on how to uh, go about some of these things. So, yes. I'll, I'll be back to you, Nebosha. So, uh, last year, I think I was reading the report of Wikimedia. So, when you, had, you mentioned something in your uh, introduction as well, like how within Wikimedia Serbia, you are exploring that the activities that you are doing does not only help the country or the region in Serbia, but also goes beyond Serbia, serves to the community or helps to the community uh, within uh, CEE or global. So I read in the last uh, uh, progress report, annual report of Wikimedia Serbia that the e uh, Eduwiki Outreach Collaborators was mentioned as like a regionalization ap approach towards like providing support within the CEE region. So. My question is like, when you think of that as a reg regionalization approach, what comes to your mind as EOC being like regionalized, being supported by a particular region and build something out of it, yeah. Yeah, um, I definitely think that um, um, uh, putting that uh, on the regional level would definitely help to hear more from some smaller communities. Um, you remember we organized the first CE meeting within uh, EVO group and we had so many participants. Cyprus. Back then, yeah. I have never met anyone from Cyprus before, so that yeah. was the first time yeah, I met yeah. someone from Cyprus. Yeah. And uh, they were all like willing to participate, to share their experience, and I think uh, some chapters or user groups uh, were uh, felt very welcome to to share um, everything with us at that time. So um, that uh, practice shows that uh, regional um, or, uh, organizing uh, such things at regional levels is uh, very important. Uh, I think in C region we have uh, that kind of problem with the uh, smaller. Um, um, chapters or user groups uh, that are not uh, active enough and they have uh, really good things to share with others. They have uh, many good practices but they are not visible um, so much. Um, um, setting everything uh, in that way would also help uh, overcome um, those uh, time zones and uh, organizing all kind of meetings because uh, it's feels uh, like um, it is much easier in organizational <laughs> uh, terms. And um, it's really important uh, not to um, forget that some regions are um, feeling very close uh, because of some cultural and historical and social um, um, things they share all together. Uh, some regions um, um, feeling closer because of the language as well. So uh, I think uh, that would be really uh, great uh, because they can also organize some um, joint programs or, or projects. Um, like for example, we tried before COVID or actually the, the year COVID starts with North Macedonia to organize Edovic camp for high school um, uh, students. So. Um, and uh, the, the last thing, but um, uh, also very important, is that uh, it could be possible to mo motivate uh, teachers and professors from schools and faculties to participate more in that kind of, of events uh, when we talk about regional levels. That's exciting. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking of like, have you, have you ever had a chance to like, you know, work together with like the edu education staff within the CEE to like think of something like how can we build this sub network and like support each other in the work as well? Um, well, this experience with Evo uh, helped me and uh, motivated me to participate um, in the men mentorship program. Um, that um, user group uh, Wikimedia and Education organized and uh, I participated twice. So I had a chance to share my experience with uh, my colleagues from um, Philippines, Nigeria, Ghana. And uh, I also participated in the podcast oh, yeah. that we organized, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also uh, had a chance to uh, talk to others uh, about that and I think that uh, kind of uh, uh, mentorship program is a great example of how it can be done, uh, but also um, 
some maybe working groups, yeah. um, like the one we heard, Let's Connect or C Hub or uh, things like that. Yeah. Yes, it feels like, you know, like we are all so interconnected with the work, mm -hmm. like one thing connects another and that helps like others who are part of our community or our movement. Um, so now I'll come back to Bukola. Bukola, newsletter team within the Edubiki Outreach Collaborators has been self-organizing, I think for last, like we started like the newsletter team like two and a half years back and it has been like self-organizing for the last one and a half years. I've like done nothing, like initially during the initial days, I would support a bit on that. But this group has been very independent within the Edwiki Outreach Collaborators group. And uh, my question for you is, where do you see the future of this group? Whether it's a newsletter team, whether you see the Edwiki Outreach Collaborators, what, what future comes to it? And like, where this model best fit in? Okay, uh, so for the future, I think uh, it goes beyond just um, the newsletter. We also like see uh, the communication evolving over time, like also like um, thinking out of not just getting stories for the newsletter, but also like um, helping people get featured on not just the podcast, but like having like an interview uh, like a physical interview where you like meet with these um, education leaders and like you get to provide an opportunity for them to um, talk more about their projects and activities. So uh, also we see the newsletter going beyond just uh, um, talking about what people are doing in the education, but also like inviting other people outside of the Wikimedia education to like talk more about um, from their own context, how they see education and how we can like align what the Wikimedia education is doing with uh, what they are doing in their various organization and institution. So I, I see it going beyond just engaging uh, Wikimedians, but also like uh, providing opportunity for people outside of the Wikimedia education uh, community to also kind of talk about what they do. But that aligns with what we are doing, yes. But that's a good point, but I also wanted to like hear your perspective around like, maybe both of you, like Nebosha and Bukola, like, where, where do you see the future of EOC? You know, we talk about like, yes, we are looking for like a bigger audience to come to us, you know, use our platforms, share their stories, but also like where, where, where does the EOC stand in the next few years? <laughs> um, I would say definitely in uh, setting more of these regional connections. And um, uh, I would not like to forget uh, connecting uh, then regions um, between each other because, for example, we have a really good education program in Argentina. They have really developed like, a lot of learning materials, for example, and I think it's uh, also important to share that way, not only on regional level, but uh, I would definitely go for, for um, yeah. That so kind with, the, that with the regional f focus, but also like a global goal. Yeah. So you know, you can exactly. talk to each other yeah. in a global level, yeah. but still work in the regional as well to support each other. Yeah. Um, do we have any questions for this group? Has anyone here attended any regional meeting that we have organized before? Okay. Oh, yes. Nice. Oh, yeah, yeah, you, you, you were a speaker in one of them, right, Amanda? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Brahim is our look, one of the organizers, yes. So, no questions? Maybe I'll ask you a question. So, what kind of support do you need from the movement entities to support the work that you are doing as a group, as a peer support group, to be more self-organizing and providing the support to the community? Well, I would um, say that um, it would be best to have like uh, more knowledge uh, 
on how to do these kind of things because uh, maybe um, some chapters or user groups have more experience in that because it's not easy to coordinate uh, so many um, chapters uh, on a regional level. So definitely uh, some experience uh, um, about that and uh, support in uh, um, maybe organizing some in-person events uh, um, sometimes. Okay. Yeah. You have a response? <laughs> Plus one, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We are the going in the Wikimedian way. So thanks everyone for joining. Uh, so we are coming up with a new cohort of EOG. We are still like restructuring, re-strategizing, and re-scoping three R's. Uh, not the recycle and thing, but what we are rescoping. So you will hear more updates about the uh, this peer support network and where it stands in the future, and what new did we bring with the next cohort. I will be sharing more links about it. We look forward for your participation. We look forward to create the space of like learning, collaboration, and one thing I forgot to mention that the ownership of a platform. So we want you to own uh, the introduction and also the the policy and the rules of Wikipedia and also the part where they are uh, asked to create uh, and to edit uh, articles. And usually we are helped by two active volunteers who are experienced uh, with Wikipedia to help uh, manage the participants and also answer their questions. And so far we have organized 16 online course. Uh, I'm going to be uh, going th through this real quick. So um, we start by listing all the requirements that we need, the platform. We use Google Platform at first because we thought that it's the easier and the uh, most accessible one. Uh, and then also the certificate certification requirements, what a participant needs to do to fulfill all the requirements and to get a certificate. The materials, the video tutorials that we had to create in such short period of time, and also the assignments, grading, and some live sessions that we organize to connect more with the participants. So yeah, um, Google Classroom is used because it's easy. Um, there is an interface uh, with Indonesian language, so uh, it's, it makes participants uh, easier to access the course. And also, there is a certification requirement, requirements. They have to fulfill the assignments. They have to join the course from the beginning to the end. Uh, they have to attend at least few uh, of the online sessions. And then they have to edit 20 articles, uh, at least on Wikipedia, and achieving 80% grade out of 100 uh, in the course. And the materials. Uh, the introduction to Wikimedia and the movement and, of course, intro introduction to Wikipedia, the interface, the five pillars, uh, user accounts, uh, talk pages, communication, profiles, and everything. And also the notability, references, uh, neutrality, plagiarism, and also the style of writing. Video tutorials, we also have the video tutorials to guide them, uh, and also the assignments for every topic in each unit that we will grade, um, and the grading system uh, that, that is done by the uh, two of the volunteers that help us. And the live sessions to get engaged more with the participants and give them the opportunity to ask questions directly to us. Um, and this is the example of the course timeline. I'll go, I, I'll skip this, but it will be available on the presentation. Um, and the results, so, uh, so far, 821 people have joined the course and uh, 378 or about 46% of people have passed the course. And there are 9,509 articles have been edited and 95 people are still active, uh, which means that the uh, engagement rate is 25%, which is uh, way better than the offline activities that we have done. That uh, usually uh, when we have online uh, offline activities, uh, 20 people join, but none will, uh, you know, continue to to edit Wikipedia. So uh, we have, oh sorry, we have some follow-up activities to get them more engaged and to get them to stay. Uh, to do more uh, activities with Wikimedia Indonesia, um, like uh, just like small conference and also training of trainers for them. And uh, this is the distribution of the participants. So it's proven that, yeah, of course, online course 
can reach more contributors um, in different regions uh, in Indonesia. Um, and this is uh, some of the highlighted changes. Online course, our online course is more comprehensive, which we think is the main factor that make a lot of the participants uh, stay contributing to the Wikipedia because they do not only learn on how to edit, but also they learn about the, how the community works, how the platform really works behind the scene, what are the stories and the drama on the talk pages and everything, and that's what keep them uh, engaged. Uh, and sorry for the heavy slides, but this is uh, the highlighted feedbacks from the participants. Um, yeah, it's just a mixed reaction or like opinions for, for them. Uh, some of them think that the course was really fun, it's structured, uh, but some of them had difficulties in managing the time because it sets a very rigorous demands. It's very strict in order for them to be able to pass the course. And it was very demanding, but uh, yeah, some, some people thought that it helped them to go through long, boring holidays and uh, they were very happy with the certification and the souvenirs that we gave to them after passing the course. So uh, I'm inviting my partner, Dian, to talk about this part. Um, we're currently also developing a prototype of our online platform using Moodle, and Dian will be talking about this. OK, thank you, Amy. Uh, I hope you can hear me. OK, so yeah. Yeah, maybe you can visit it also by this QR code. Uh, we are in Indonesia, is currently uh, building this prototype. Uh, this is our first LMS prototype, and uh, it started because we face uh, some registration issue with Google Classroom, because uh, and it makes our participants find it difficult to sign up with non-Gmail accounts. Uh, besides, we also have limited quota for each batch, just like Amy said before. We only have, uh, the course is only available for 80 participants in maximum. Uh, and sometimes people email us and say that, uh, I have registered for twice, but why you guys reject me again? And we were like, uh, that's not because of you, that's just us. In fact, we have limited, uh, wiki trainer, so we have to limit the seat also for this course. And uh, yeah, this is what we love most about our prototype because it offers more option for enrollment. Yeah, as you can see, uh, it's available for manual enrollment and self enrollment because we want uh, we wanted to make some self-enrollment so that uh, people who want to learn about Wikimedia projects can also learn it by themselves. And uh, who is behind this prototype? Okay, so this prototype uh, we built in uh, with our technology team and one LMS consultant for around three months. Uh, it started in November till January, and it's uh, we for this developing phase. We only focus on the registration and content migration from Google Classroom to Moodle. We also realized that uh, for with the new platform, we have to adapt because we can we cannot make it just like Google Classroom, right? We uh, uh, we need to adapt to the new platform. So here is some feature that uh, we have in our uh, prototype. Yeah, an index in a sidebar. Okay, also available for discussion for the participants. And this is our uh, learning materials. It contains uh, video tutorials just like Amy said. Uh, this is my. This is our old version of a video. We are currently uh, remaking the new, the newer video tutorial with that we have. That we hope can more be engaging for uh, the participants. 
This is the grading and the report. Uh, I will skip this. Yeah, uh, this site is also available uh, in smartphone. Uh, we try to make it as easy and light as possible so that everyone can access it uh, this site. And uh, we make it accessible for the smart smartphone because uh, since our Indonesian participants uh, still dominated by smartphones user from the young age to the elder. So what's next? Uh, I hope uh, after this uh, we can, we wanna uh, try to make, lim to test limited, uh, to, to have a limited uh, test for our communities and we hope uh, that we also plan to make the course available also for not only Wikipedia project but also in other Wikimedia projects. projects. So uh, our Wikidata team is also preparing for the materials uh, like uh, the education team preparing the video materials also. Uh, I hope uh, in the someday uh, I can say to the Indonesian like uh, no, now uh, no one will reject you because uh, not even the organizers because now you can uh, register it by yourself and you can learn it by yourself. I think it's all. Oh yeah, um, just uh, like. Uh, you see before it's uh, still a prototype we uh, it's still uh, it's not perfect yet it's still a long run for us to uh, to have a full uh, fully pages of fully package of LMS and we are running on that uh, we hope in the next year we uh, we can uh, prepare and develop the be better version of our LMS. I think that's it from me and Amy. Thank you. Can I, okay, can I have okay. the, the passing? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so I'm going to share with you this work in progress for MOOC for educators that we are developing in Brazil. And um, this year we started to build this massive online open course at Wikiversity that aims to present in a condensed and simplified way information educators need to start using Wikimedia projects with their students. Our main objective is to show them how Wikimedia projects can be valuable tools for, and space for the development of their university programs, especially at extension level, um, which I'll explain a little bit further. In this course, we want to gather all the information that is usually passed on our first meetings with educators who want to build extension and education programs involving Wikimedia projects. Since there is a huge demand of Wikimovimento Brasil's support and the demand that is meant to grow exponentially, and I will explain why later, we decided to build the course as a way to handle all the existing demand and to prepare for the one that is to come. The MOOC is not intended to replace existing material that is evident, especially about Wikipedia, nor to delve into specific advanced details of the Wikimedia project, but to give all the information and guidance professors and educators need to gain confidence to start building their own programs with the Wikimedia project. In this way, all the information that is usually scattered on pages of Wikimedia projects is being condensed into a single space on Wikiversity, into a single um, yeah, in, uh, in Portuguese and directed to the public in question. Wikimovimento Brasil continues to be a point of support for our, all educators, of course, but it can be uh, focused for higher quality and deeper support, since the basics are outlined and systematized in the MOOC. So which were our motivations? According to a research published this year by Liana, Shani, Philip, and João, Brazil have a highly unequal education environment and it's reflected at the Wikimedia projects educational uses. Through the years, Wikimedia education progress has been run mainly in the wealthier regions of Brazil, particularly by highly committed professor, 
at type tier universities. Also, they are centered in the southeast region, which is the, the wealthier one also. Brazilian professors also are overloaded with work and have to deal with precarious institutions that commonly doesn't have computer lab with internet for students to use. That is, they don't have enough time and support to dive in and learn about Wikimedia themselves uh, to enter this whole university on their own. Uh, so why now? Since late October, we have the funding to hire an education scientific dissemination manager. Hi. <laughs> they can be focused on education partnerships. Also in 2020, there was a change in the pattern of Brazilian programs. Just short-term programs with few students. There was also a peak with more educators getting engaged with Wikimedia projects and projects diversity. This scenario shows us that education programs with Wikimedia projects in Brazil fit perfectly and this could be a growing area. In Brazil, we have now an extension curricula curricularization. It's uh, uh, a free translation, which means that now um, this kind of voluntary activities, the extension activities, have become mandatory in the curriculum of undergraduate courses across the country. Lots of educators are seeking ways to implement their courses and Wikimedia projects can be an amazing solution. Some of them have already built some with them, with us, some projects like that with us. But what is the university extension? They are courses that aim to expand the student's knowledge in specific areas, are complementary short-term training courses, address knowledge that is not commonly seen or studied in depth by undergraduate, function as instrument of social insertion, bringing the academy closer to adjacent communities and institutions. A profile of courses that are closely related to those developed with the Wikimedia project. So, uh, to meet an ex existing demand and prepare for the one to come, we decided to build this MOOC at Wikiversity. It is an asynchronous course without tutoring, with the possibility of being carried out at the time and desired order. We will provide off-hours and synchronous schedule thematic meetings with a Wiki Movement Brazil professionals and voluntary team to ask questions and seek for individual help. The MOOC is divided into six modules, one for introduction, one for educational programs, and one for each of the four projects covered, Wikipedia, Wikidata, Wikimedia Commons, and Wikiversity. We also built a strong advising and strategic committee yeah. We also built a strong advising strategic committee with these seven amazing and dedicated Wikimedians to make sure we are going in the right direction. But mainly with the committee, we wanted to share their experience and learn from them. So, thank you so much. Um, and this is a screenshot of some of us at our first meeting. Uh, and this is our translator, Vitor, that made everyone understood. <laughs> At the committee meetings, we discussed about the MOOC's content, that could be fine, uh, what be the final tasks, the course name, about creating a contact channel, and scheduled meetings throughout the school year. We discussed about the kind of content that should be in video format, which format the videos should have, and how we could register and make visible all the extension courses, partnerships for the community to see. What we have so far, now that we have discussed it, every part of the MOOC content is being written, the interface is being programmed, the course visual identity is being developed. Next month, videos are going to be recorded and edited, and we expect that the MOOC is going to be ready for the second semester of 2023. This is how it looks like now. Um, we still haven't approved the visual identity, but I, I still wanted to show you how it looks like now. It's a uh, work in, in progress. And um, the colors and background should be changed, but as you can see, it's becoming something already. We already have decided all the, um, the layers that are going to have. And with this MOOC, we intend to help and convince more 
and more educators and professors to use the Wikimedia projects with their students. We know how fruitful this can be, but now we want more and more educators to also know it, and we want them to know how to do it. We expect that the MOOC can play this part and be a successful entry to the university uh, and to Wikimedia universe. This is all the six modules. And yeah, thank you. Do we have questions? So uh, thank you, thank you for this uh, lovely presentation. So my question is to Amy. So uh, you are talking about your uh, education programs or courses. So uh, I, sorry, I don't know how to say this politely, but uh, how this certificate add value to someone's academic or professional life? The uh, the co uh, certificate of your course. How does your uh, certificate, certificate of your course, add values to someone's life, whether it be academic or professional life? Yeah, um, thank you very much. But in Indonesia, certification is very popular and it's a very effective way to engage people, actually. And, um, well, the certificate itself, um, I don't know exactly, like, the the value in, like, academic field or if you want to apply for a job or something like that. But we offer certification uh, as an appreciation uh, because, yeah, as I said before, certification is uh, is apparently something that I think almost everyone in Indonesia is looking for when they apply for an activity. They almost always uh, ask whether the activity has a certificate or not. So um, it's just an appreciation for them to, you know, that they have like passed the course, but we don't know exactly. I mean, like it also depends on what kind of things that they would use the certificate to apply for. But um, yeah, I think I think um, yeah, it depends on that. But um, it's signed by the chair of Wikimedia Indonesia, so maybe like that means something in some uh, institutions when you apply there. But that's the reason why we put like certification is because. Uh, it is one of uh, you know one of the way that we can reach or engage people. Sometimes people just like uh, don't care like what certificate it is, but our certificate is uh, guaranteed that it's uh, it's legal and it's um, you know like it's signed by the chair of Wikimedia Indonesia. It's not only certificate that's generated automatically with just like random uh, signature or whatever, but it's it's official from Wikimedia Indonesia uh, and it's just like as appreciation to them that they have passed the course and so far they have um, all the participants that have passed the course most of them have been really appreciative of the certificates and also uh, the souvenirs but I always um, said to them that it's not about the certificate it's not about the souvenirs but it's about something bigger that you're about to get into once you pass the course because then after that if you are you know actively engaged in the communities in Wikimedia Indonesia then you will get much more than just certificates and souvenir, you'll get networking and uh, experience. And a lot of them attended our national conference, which uh, we're really happy about. So yeah, I think, I, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation. I have two questions, and I know we don't have much time. So one question for Indonesia was, um, do you have any, so you re remarked that the, the retention rate of participants in the online course had a quite impressive retention rate, you said like 25%, and you said that was more than your, the, the, uh, the off wiki, the kind of in-person wiki lati courses. Do you have any hypotheses as to why uh, that retention rate was, was bigger? And then I have another question for Brazil after this, but maybe quick. <laughs> um, okay, I think it's because the online course is more comprehensive and it gives uh, more 
depth understanding to Wikipedia and also the community and how it works. And that's why um, for the span of like three weeks, they get to learn much more about what's behind the scenes. While the offline activities, it only lasts for four hours and we only uh, give them like the editing training. Okay, they can edit now, but they don't really have the knowledge of how the community works. And uh, the I think also during the three weeks, the, the, the amount of experience that they have, the familiarity towards Wikipedia is what makes them actively uh, you know, uh, continue to get engaged in the activities after they pass the course. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, that's very helpful. Okay. Thank you. So Thank better you. learning outcomes, it sounds like. Yeah. yeah. And my question for Brazil is we heard a little bit about in Indonesia that the, the evaluation, some, some, some sense of the evaluation that led to, you know, piloting on Google Classroom and then saying, oh, we're going to do Moodle. I'm curious what, uh, what uh, evaluation process you had that led you to choose Wikiversity as your platform. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is a course meant to professors to make them enter the Wikimedia University, the Wikimedia Universe, and then take Wikimedia projects to the university to their own courses. So our main objective here is not to build a capacitation like they are capacit and they have a certification of something, because in Brazil, um, prof university professors don't really care for that. Uh, and we were trying to think about that and with the committee, we, sh we arrived at, at a place that we decided that are going to be uh, final tasks on each model. And these tasks are going to be related to what we want them to do. So the final task, that is the final one, uh, after all the six modules, and that they have to complete them all to have the certification. Um, the final task will be to build a extension program. To, is that what we want them to do? So they are going to put in practice what we want them to do. So with that work that have, they have done in the course, they can go into the university and just apply that. So in each module, in um, Wikipedia, Wikidata, they're going to practice something to use in the in the program uh, we haven't developed uh, the tasks yet but we have the idea that they are going to be something like that and about the certification we are going to give a certification of ours because they can be at some universities uh, used by professors to move up in the career but uh, not all, because in Brazil, each state has, has their own uh, rules about this stuff, and maybe each university has their own rules. So we are going to think about a certification that is um, more general and can attend a, a lot of more professors, but some will not use it for something, and uh, we know about that, and we are very sorry, but we will give the certification. Did I answer? Yeah, thank you okay. very much. Um, okay, I think we are. Uh, yeah, but uh, we are. I mean, the break is starting right now, so uh, maybe you can continue talking there. Uh, sorry, so we can just. Um, go move on to the break. So thank you all. Thank you for, pre for presenting your experience with uh, the uh, courses. It was really, um, it was really insightful. Uh, and now I invite you to join the breaks, to have some refreshment and to go back at 3.30. Tr uh, thank you.
We are almost at the end of the second day, and our next session is um, 21st Century Skills in Action. So Florencia, Jackie, Hernan, uh, along with uh, Olga, but Olga is not here, uh, will share the experience of the internship program carried out in the framework of um, the project 21st Sexual, uh, Century Skills in Action. Here you go. Well, hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Florencia Guastavino. I'm from the Education and Human Rights um, program of Wikimedia Argentina. And uh, here we are with uh, Jacqueline. Jacqueline Bucio from Wiki, uh, Wikimedia Mexico. No. Jacqueline Bucio, no. Yeah, Jacqueline Bucio from Wikimedia Mexico again. Y Hernán Pérez, Wikimedia Colombia. Okay, so we are going to present uh, this experience that is called 21st Century Skills in Action. And we, the, the main issue is that we collaborate with some chapters on the Latin American and Caribbean region. Uh, here is a summary of the experience. It started in November 2021 with an online course that was called 21st Century Skill in Action, Digital Citizens, Citizens well, I'm not going to say it, okay? <laughs> and Wikimedia Projects. Um, this, uh, this project was founded by the IDB Bank and by Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, we had tw uh, 216 Latin American participants that started the course and uh, 74 that ended successfully. And it was aimed for youth, uh, young people between 18 and 35 years, as to uh, learn about digital uh, citizenship. Uh, as you say, the strength was to, to strengthen digital literacy, to reduce content and learning gaps. And afterwards, the 74 people that ended the course presented a project and 10 of them were selected to make an internship program in some of the Latin American chapters and also in the Wikimedia Foundation. So uh, today we are going to tell you about the experience of how were the internships in each of our uh, chapters. Sorry, so with Wikimedia Mexico, we have the pleasure of working with Esther Bravo, and uh, she is passionate about information. She was doing this uh, postgraduate PhD in information science, so it fit perfectly. And she developed these uh, abilities w working with the education team in Wikimedia Mexico. She was assigned uh, to work with Alejandro Reyes, or Alex, as we call him. Uh, and we had the pleasure of working with her. She was really involved in uh, three main uh, events or activities. Uh, first, the organization of One Rea, One Ref. She, she was working with logistics, uh, uh, making the minutes, uh, coordinating these events along with Alex, and also in uh, the organization of this third education local gathering. She was involved in uh, coordinating also these activities. And also she participated in some uh, audio seminars. We have this activity for uh, talking about articles uh, related to Wikipedia education projects. We got, uh, get together in a in an app called Clubhouse and just uh, get rid of the camera and just uh, walk in audio about these articles. So she was also involved in these, uh, in these seminars. Um, first, the, the achievements are this, but uh, the challenge is the learning curve. Uh, three months is really a short time, short period of time to get involved into the philosophy of the movement. They really go deep into the uh, collaboration within the uh, Wikimedia activities. And the time was short, the enthusiasm was a lot, but it's a heavy learning cur curve, as I think uh, my colleagues are going to say also. <clears throat> Okay, so for the Colombian experience, I chose to bring the words of the intern we had in Colombia. 
So what I'm going to do is read some of the reflections this person had after the experience. So I wanted to start with this phrase that uh, he brought. It was, uh, Wikipedia could translate uh, the research into a common language, the knowledge, of the traditional knowledge and social movement and make them transcend. This for me showed a lot about what this experience meant for this person. Um, Andres Barragan, he is 23 years old, uh, uh, professional in international marketing, and he thought that being part of Wikimedia Colombia was a, a, a fact to dignify the power of knowledge and the recognition of uh, human rights and environmental rights. So this is a second phrase he brought. It was, uh, Wikipedia gives me power to incise in the recollection of environmental problematics and for me this is very interesting because it shows the empowerment uh, approach you know the this skill development of the formation uh, got installed in his uh, now tools to approach his professional life and um, so the achievements uh, of the of this experience I chose this, this uh, phrase of him, like he went from a Facebook post, he first saw this formation on a, on a Facebook post, and then he got an internship, and then he like, applied this to his professional and personal project. So this shows how this trajectory of learning could uh, start with just a simple uh, Facebook post, but with like a very deep uh, significant uh, formation experience. And a challenge in, in his words were uh, that those who live the struggles of life become the voice that adds content to the Wikipedia. And I, I really felt uh, empathized with, with this phrase because this is the approach that the Wikimedia Colombia wants to give to the education program, uh, to give voice to these uh, traditionally excluded communities around the, the country. So. Um, this intern saw the same challenge we're seeing uh, now. So for us, this is a very interesting experience as well. Well, then we, as you all know, Olga couldn't come to the conference, but she was going to participate. And some other countries that also participate in the experience were Chile, Uruguay, um, and I think that an internship in the Wikimedia Foundation and some other country I, I can't remember right now, but there were participants from uh, Central America and from all over Latin America. And this is the internship uh, of, of Bolivia, that is Karen Rodriguez Barradas, and she worked, uh, if, I, if, if we know well, in the Reading Wikipedia, in the classroom projects and some other projects because she was uh, training as a teacher also. And then in, in Wikimedia Argentina, we had two interns one was Fabian Mamani, that he lives in Jujuy, in the north of the country. He's a librarian and a poet, and he works in popular libraries. Uh, he did his internship in Wikimedia Argentina Culture and, and Open Knowledge Program, and he worked in two activities, a survey for popular libraries, and then the design of a specific course that is running right now, and they have like more, more than 200 librarians uh, participating on the course right now. I don't know if you know what is a popular library, but it's like a library of a town or a small library that is made by the people. So it's really interesting the work that, that he did. And Fabian continue working with us now as a, as a volunteer, but in some really main projects. And then we work with Laura, uh, that she was an informatics system engineer, and she worked with the Education and Human Rights Program in two uh, aspects, the development of Wikipuentes, that is our main virtual course, and also some communication of contents of uh, Wikipedia. So with the achievements, um, we think that it's really, it was really interesting for us to share the ways we work. We had a lot, uh, as, as Shaki said, there's a lot of uh, learning with the, with the interns. And one of the learnings is to explain how we work inside the chapter. That maybe is different uh, through all the chapters uh, all over the world. So that is really interesting, not only for the intern, but also for us as to show how do we work and maybe what do we have to uh, um, learn or do in another ways through the, the, the thoughts and of the intern. Uh, so that was really interesting for us and with a, a challenge uh, we had, we, we thought in the education program that Laura would work 
all along uh, Wikipuentes, and in that Wikipuentes, we had not a lot of participants, so her work wasn't really depth in that, in that case, so we have in the middle of the internship to change her, her work. So she started working in communications, and uh, in our case, the, uh, the internship, in, in every case, it was from April to June, but we, she added in, in a, an activity that had already started, so it's not so easy to add an intern in the middle of a work process. So one thing that we think is interesting to think is if you want to add interns or if you are thinking for interns to your chapters, it's, it's really um, good to think when you make your annual project or your biannual project to have that in mind because it's not so easy to adapt a person uh, on a work that is already in progress. And as an overall, and, and we had like uh, some meetings during the, the internship, um, they were like three or five where we, all, all the people that was um, a company, an intern, we gather and we talk about what, what are the challenges and what are the good things about the internship. We think that it's a really, op a really nice opportunity to strengthen the capacity of each of the, of the chapters. Both of the participants that they learned a lot and for their work it was really interesting because then they can put it in their curriculum and say I work in a huge institution like Wikimedia Foundation or Wikimedia uh, any chapter and also for us that because we receive a, a, a really um, trained person to do a lot of things that maybe were, we weren't able to do before. And then it's also enhanced the coordination between the chapters. We are really used to work together, but it was a really nice experience because there were like eight or nine chapters working together all along this month. So it's, it's really good for a region to make an internship, but not may, may, maybe not one chapter, but a group of chapters because we learn a lot in the coordinated work between us. So well, if you have any questions, I know we have some time. Um, that's all. Um, okay. <laughs> um, thank you. So, questions? Uh -huh. Sorry. <laughs> thank you, guys, for your presentation. Uh, it was interesting. Could you please elaborate more how the selection process of interns uh, were carried out, like based on which criteria you selected interns, and uh, how exactly like interns can contribute to the chapter development? Maybe I lost some information, so if it's not difficult, please. The, um, the process of selection was after the virtual course. They all participate in a virtual course, and at the end of the virtual course, they had to make a, a final activity, a written final activity that was a project. So they have to investigate uh, some of the chapters and say, well, for this chapter, I would like to make this project. And then in the reading of the projects and also in the, the virtual course, there were tutors that were following them so they know who, who was who. And so that was part of the selection process. Uh, and they, they select the people that were most um, near what the chapter was doing so that it was uh, easy to, to adapt. And I didn't get the second question, sorry. My second question was how exactly like the interns contributed to your chapter development like what was the predefined goals and uh, do they achieved like exactly what they're planning in the starting of the internship their internship basically okay I think that depends on each intern uh, in in our case um, Fabian that was the one who worked with libraries he uh, is already a, a Wikimedian so maybe he could achieve a lot more of the goals, for example, design the virtual course. In the case of Laura, that was the, the, the other person, she was really new to the movement, so her achievements were more about learning how we work and learning what is education, and as she was an engineering, a uh, system engineering, uh, she it was really out of the education world, so it was really an achievement for her to learn about that, but maybe she couldn't make a product as Fabian did because it was like different uh, where, we, where they come from. Um, I don't know if you want to tell me. Yeah, probably a good advice would be to uh, harmonize their internship with the uh, campaigns, for example, Wiki for Human Rights, 
that will be a, a good place to start to involve in, in like an activity that's already running. So I, I would say that every chapter has like a focus on, on, on the context. So just to involve them in, in these uh, campaigns could be like a good mm -hmm. starting point. And one small question in addition, are they planning to like continue work with the chapters? I, I think that that depends on each person. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, some of them did and some other not. The, the internship was paid, so every for for each month they receive a payment, so that that it was like a work. Uh, but then afterwards, it wasn't. Uh, not, not everyone continue working or vinculated with the chapter. Thank you. Uh, for, for for the Colombian experience, I'm sorry, I need to read the the movement. Uh, Andres invited Colombia because now he's a mentor within a, a movement uh, which I'm gonna tell the name, I'm sorry, I don't know it. Uh, and uh, he offered a place for Wikimedia Colombia to uh, share the experience uh, within the Protect Our Planet movement. So you know, the relation like uh, went on and now he offers spaces for the Wikimedia Colombia to show uh, the work that can be done with, with, within the uh, Wikimedia ecosystem. Do we have questions? No? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, we have last um, lightning talks for today. So I'll call Lucy, Rebecca O'Neill, Irvin, uh, Irvin and Rafi um, couldn't make it because of the visa, so they recorded their sessions and I'll um, play the video for you, videos, and Rebecca Rwanda. So you can be here in the front uh, rows or you can come when your session is up. Mm -hmm. Lucy? Oh, I love <laughs> Can I take the other mic again? Thank you. Three minutes, I will try. So, uh, Senior Rights Wikipedia in Czech Republic, we run it for almost 10 years now, and I guess many of you heard about it, but I would like to celebrate a little bit that it's 10 years now. And so, this is the logo. I know that some of the other uh, affiliates decided to use it as well. Feel free to, it's at Commons. And this is actually the guy who found it, uh, Professor Jan Sokol, and he emphasized on that it's really pity that there is so many old people who have the experience and they feel useless, but they actually could contribute quite well to Wikipedia and to contribute to the education of younger generations. Unfortunately, he passed uh, away two years ago, but he was the founding member of the Senior Rights Wikipedia IDEA, and as well, he himself, it's a Wikimedian, Wikipedian, he edited about 5,000 articles in Czech language. And uh, yeah, uh, so the uh, people who managed to go through our courses, they as well can get one of those stars. And so we had about 600 people so far going through the courses and more than 17 towns where the courses have been organized. Uh, this is how it looks in reality, us meeting with them. This is František Šťastný, he has a very wonderful TED talk about him being involved in Wikipedia. Uh, this is the physical courses, uh, there in the corner it's Anai, Jana, our lecturer, she's senior as well, but she runs courses like that with the full room. 
And I see as well around online courses on commons. So this is an online course, how to upload and how to photograph for commons. Uh, we run an alumni club where we meet. So these are some of my wonderful colleagues from the office, but as well many of our alumni from the courses. This is the editatons, but I want to show with this one that uh, once the seniors take part in our courses, they don't disappear. So we have a very good community who connects with us. They come. This is this is from the Czech uh, Wikigap edition this year, and as you can see, they all come to Wikigap. All these guys have been there editing the female articles. Isn't that wonderful? And two of them are members of the NGO at the moment as well. And I would not be able to work on that if I would not have all the like all the guys in the lectures community. This is another lecture, this is Anna again, and it's intergenerational work because we as well have our young uh, members in the community to join and to take part. Uh, Jan just graduated uh, last week from high school, uh, but he's our lecturer as well. He teaches the seniors to edit Wikipedia. He shoots all the videos we have, and he's joining my education team starting from June. Yeah, this is our education team. Um, thank you. Now we call the first Rebecca. <laughs> uh, no, it's the lightning talk, so you'll have the time, the questions for afterwards. This one? Uh -huh. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm Rebecca O'Neill, and I'm the project coordinator for Wikimedia Community Ireland, and the first Rebecca. <laughs> Rebecca 1 and Rebecca A. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick, um, I've pres presented on this, um, so there's two videos online if you want to learn a little bit more about it. It's an Erasmus project um, that we have, um, that I'll tell you a little bit more about. But if you want to learn more, if you just Google me, in the edgy wiki week that we did, uh, we did a presentation for that. Or come talk to me. Okay. So, very briefly, uh, the project was inspired by Women in Red, but it's going to focus, it is focusing on three target minority languages. So, it's, um, we have partners in the Basque country, in Ireland, and uh, in, the, uh, in Friesland, in the Netherlands. And the idea is to get uh, high school students to focus on writing biographies about notable women relevant to their regions or their languages. Um, so promoting the language and our quote unquote unknown histories, which of course you know, we know that women's history isn't unknown, it's just undocumented a lot of the time. Uh, so surfacing these ideas of knowledge gaps and uh, gender biases to, um, to young people in these three contexts. Uh, that's the, the funding that we secured for it. So it started in 2000, uh, 2012, sorry, 2012. 2022, uh, so last year, and it'll run um, until December next year. So we're in our middle year at the moment. We've so what I'm going to present to you now is just a few slides on our first kind of pilot materials that we've created. So the outputs of this project are going to be three toolkits: so one um, for students, one for educators, and one for glam professionals. And it won't surprise anybody in this room that the glam professional one is proving the most difficult. Um, but the idea is that this Wiki Women project then is something that they can um, take off the shelf with a toolkit and implement in their own context once um, our project is finished. So these are our partners, and you can see where, where we are. So we have um, three Dutch Frisian partners, um, two Basque partners, and two um, Irish partners. Um, you'll see that in Ireland and in the Basque country that two schools are the partners. Uh, that's because in those two regions you actually have the education of the students is entirely through those languages, whereas in Friesland the students take it as an optional subject when they're kind of towards um, the end of high school. So there is no Frisian medium school that they can go to where they learn everything in Frisian. So it's a smaller group of students that they, they um, have uh, as, a, as a pool. So what did we learn in our very first week? So here are some of the Basque students working away very hard, and I have to thank Alder for uploading some photographs to Wikimedia Commons, otherwise I would have had no, uh, no illustrations for you at all. Um, what did we learn? So the students, before they came, they had been working on their biographies. 
So they had been taught how to use Wikipedia, they had been uh, brought to local libraries and introduced to the idea of research, and they had been introduced to the tools that they could use, how to cite, um, looking at kind of other good quality articles within their language Wikipedias. Um, but what did it feel like when all, so there's eight, roughly eight students from each context will travel. So we had, I think six from Friesland, eight from the Basque Country came to Ireland. So they came to Monaghan, um, which is uh, in the north of Ireland, for their very first in-person Wikithon. And one of the most surprising things that we discovered is that, and this was surprising for the GLAMs, that students were most interested in living people. They weren't very interested in dead people, unfortunately, which, you know, generally if you're an archive or a museum, you're dealing <laughs> with people who are <laughs> not alive anymore. Um, so I know that some GLAMs really then kind of struggle to be relevant uh, to the students. Um, students really wanted to draw on their own interests. This is not particularly surprising, but I think some of the educators and some of the GLAM professionals found this surprising. So students chose to write about sports people in a, in a sport that they played. Um, if they were musicians themselves, they wanted to write about a musician from their country and um, so on. One that really took people by surprise was writing about influencers. Uh, <laughs> Very tough. Um, so the, but the cultural exchange was really important for the students. They really wanted to share with each other songs, dances, um, turns of phrase from their own context. And they really relished, like from the minute there was no shyness, they wanted to be with each other because they had not traveled, they had not gone on school trips for three years. So they really appreciated doing something in person, which was wonderful to see. There was no kind of awkwardness, which was fantastic with teenagers, very unusual. So this was our first cohort of students. We'll have um, a second one starting uh, from September with the students actually doing the project from, um, and if you want to know what, what these strange straw things are, ask me later on. Um, but the three main things that we got out of it was, out of that in-person, so what the students would actually do together is that they were really interested in actually working on translation, which we were really surprised by. We had thought that we would introduce them to some local Irish women that they could write about in their local context, but what they really wanted to do was translate each other's articles onto their own language. Um, so we just, we just adapted and, and we did that. Unsurprisingly, if you've worked with teenagers, they want to work really quickly. They really don't want to wait around for their article to be published. They want to edit it right now and they want to see it on the other language Wikipedia. Why hasn't my info box gone across? Why hasn't my image gone across? Why is this template broken? Like they want fixes right, right, right now. So one of the things we're going to do is do the research piece. So introducing them to the research skills at the start and not introduce the Wikipedia element until much later on because they were getting distracted by the Wikipedia element too early. And the main thing that everybody learned that the Irish were able to teach them, which is this piece of Irish here, which is Tirgan Tanga Tirgan Anam, which means um, a country without a language is a country without a soul. And I will leave you with that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And now, Irvin's presentation, which will be in video. Hello everyone, I am Irvin Santa Tomas and this is my presentation. The Philippines was among the countries which had full school closures during the pandemic. In fact, the Philippines was the last country to re-allow the conduct of face-to-face -face classes without any formal classes from March 2020 to September 2021. In the basic education, limited face-to-face -face classes began in August 2022, or more than two years since the Philippine government declared community quarantine. During the pandemic, the Philippine community took it as an opportunity to promote Wikipedia outside the classroom. Well, literally, in partnership with Kintab Artists Group, we had Wiki Loves Art mural painting activities. As part of our 20th year celebration of Wikipedia in 2021. In this institutions, Phil Wiki community promoted reading Wikipedia in the classroom of the Wikimedia Foundation education team as our initiative. The Philippines Department of Education 
implemented a blended learning approach in the delivery of basic education, which included the modular distance learning modality. Interestingly, some of our contributions have even made it in the self-learning modules. So it gave me the idea to review all the self-learning modules and it led me to this study. This study was limited to English and social science modules in grades 10, 11, and 12 levels used in the first quarter. These modules were produced by the Department of Education, Region 5, Bicol. As a public school teacher, I have full access to this material. It was found that at least 50 modules used English Wikipedia and Wikimedia Commons as sources. History, literature, and culture-related articles and images were the commonly utilized information in the modules. At times, Wikipedia was properly cited. In some modules, however, only links were given. For the recommendations, Wikipedia and Wikimedia Commons should be formally introduced to school administrators as open educational resources by the Wikimedia Foundations and not just by volunteers through their initiatives. I also recommend to incentivize the teachers and school divisions that openly utilize Wikimedia projects in their lessons to remove the Wikipedia stigma among academics and to conduct regular Wikipedia trainings not just for teachers but for curriculum implementation division supervisors. Here are some of the examples. In this module, our fellow Wikipedia and Philwiki community co-founder, Hill Gregorio, was featured here. He is a published writer. Here is an example in social science. And in oral communication. The utilization of information on Wikimedia is not new in the Department of Education Beagle region. In 2016, information from Beagle Wikipedia and English Wikipedia were first utilized in a social science textbook for grade 3 level. Thank you very much. Mabalos. So the next one is Rafi. Hi everyone, Rafi here from Bangladesh and I'll be talking about NDC Wikipedia editorial and research team. Uh, my username is also the same, username Abhi Rafi and I'm from Bangladesh. And I have, you know, as I told uh, earlier that the NDC Wikipedia editorial and research team is founded by me a few years ago in my own college, in my own country in Bangladesh, which is one of the most underrepresented communities in the whole Wikimedia verse. And uh, the team, NDC Wikipedia Editorial and Research team is working, is uh, operating in the form of extracurricular organization. And it works on professional skill development of the high schoolers, basically, through contributing to the Wikimedia movement. It is very effective when you don't get direct access to the curriculum of the educational institution. Those who, uh, the organizers like me who are working in the underrepresented communities, face this a lot the authorities don't give direct access to their you know institutional activities it is efficient to increase wikimedia awareness among education stakeholders like teachers guardians and students and it paves the way for future wikimedia activism in the educational institutions we are already you know have we have already started understanding that benefit and the organization structure of this team is somewhat similar to the Wikimedia movement affiliates, but it is not an affiliate, it is a non-affiliate organized group, and it has its own executive committee, 
that changes every year with every new batch you know uh, students come every year uh, in colleges and lives uh, also every year so you know uh, matching with that cycle uh, students takes the responsibility of the executive committee every year and also leaves uh, the executive committee every year and two batches of students has already passed and we are trying to focus on creating a strong alumni base it focuses on a lot of topics as shown in the screen like some of the open source advocacy open source intelligence the community organizing outreach only key content creation and starting the dynamics of wikimedia communities and a lot and it's still in the bud the idea is still in the bud we are doing a lot of experiments and we have a lot of intended future wings like legal and advocacy dev works graphics and branding strategy and partnership leadership and management and it has a huge potential of creating future open source professionals and that's it from me thank you thanks a lot <laughs> thank you rafi <laughs> So uh, the last session is Rebecca's. You can join here. Rebecca number two. Yes, um, thank you so much. My name is Rebecca. Many people call me Rebecca, but uh, uh, I'm also named Jeanette. Yes, uh, I'm happy to share with you some uh, experiences and learnings from Wikimedia User Group Rwanda. We are a group of people uh, of three years old now. Yeah, uh, our community started in 2019 in the Movement Strategy Conference. So Kimida is a group Rwanda uh, is growing now. We are more than 300 people, but we born from, we are a product of movement strategy uh, conference, yes. Um, so I will quickly share the, the, the opportunities for us to, uh, uh, from Wikimedia to education. Um, as you can see this picture, we, we were doing this uh, Wiki for Human Rights. So, um, since we started in 2019, and we don't know what to do, where to go, but we had a chance to organize uh, one of the great uh, projects, we decided to meet up to, to look for partners. Among of the partners we got, it's uh, University of Rwanda, UR, and then um, we called them to come and uh, we share learnings. They give us a uh, science uh, knowledge experience, biodiversity, pollution, and uh, climate change and thus we give them uh, our writing skills on Wikipedia. Uh, personally, I am an environmentalist. I am also a student in uh, biodiversity, but my community, we are diverse. Some are not uh, really in the field. So this is how we do it. This is how we partner with the universities and colleges. Yes. Huh. So um, from that chance, um, we do have uh, partnerships from local institutions, like bigger, bigger uh, institutions in Rwanda. As you can see here, this image, we shared our experience on this uh, group of people. They are in village in thousand province and northern of Rwanda. So they are uh, farmers, tea farmers. So as far as you have a partnership with tea institution, so we go to train tea farmers and educate, give them awareness about uh, Wikipedia. Yes, uh, we started in 2019, as I said, somewhere in East Africa. Um, uh, this was our first project, and we were like this number. But um, I would love to say that after some, uh, some one year, uh, we got a, a trust from Wikimedia Foundation, which I always love to thank. Um, trusting a community, a small community, with only two years, you give them uh, to host a conference bigger like this one. So from this conference, we managed to get more partnership in local universities and local institutions like Ministry of ICT, Rwanda Heritage Academy, 
and some other more. So um, we created more impact, including uh, we implemented movement strategy implementation grant in East Africa. It went very successful. I'm, I'm trying to go faster. So we carried out uh, this research in uh, Congo, Burundi, and Rwanda in East Africa. I hope some of you know those countries. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So this, this was the findings. These are the statistics, but um, uh, an interesting uh, statistic, statistics is that more than 87% of the people in the region are willing to contribute on Wikipedia. The challenge is that uh, they don't know it and the language barrier. Yes, so, and, and, and again, more uh, youth. Yes. We have uh, strategies, short term and long term in education. So we, we compare short term as growing uh, a flower, just checking our mailing list from our research, texting them, sending emails, call them for our um, learnings, call them for our uh, meetups, physical or online, and then we plan them that we push our agenda in our communities. Long term, skills development, we, we, we are looking forward from the communities around the world to have partnership, maybe with key media, uh, Kenya, uh, Canada, German. Why not? Can't we have a partnership so that you can give us this experience, language, skills, uh, human capacity, resource, capacity building for us to be able to, to strengthen our community. Since our community have a lot of volunteers, uh, lecturers, community really want to be in the movement, but the skills tangible skills. So this is what we are looking forward. Yes, I think, um, I, yeah. Uh, I'm trying, maybe this is the last. Mm, yeah. Is it? Yes. Uh, so um, uh, thank you so much. That was my presentation. I was trying to be quick. Thank you all for your presentations. Uh, if you have a question or questions, feel free to ask them now. We do have time, sorry. <laughs> okay. This is intended to be funny, so at, at what age you become a senior Wikipedian? Like, <laughs> what is the criteria to become a senior Wikipedian? <laughs> yeah, it is. Just because if I turned 40 like a two, month, two weeks ago, so like, am I senior or not? I would say as soon as you dare to enter the courses for the seniors. <laughs> would that work as an answer? Yes. Other questions, comments? Yeah, yeah. One comment that uh, the seniors from Lucci's program were very helpful for uh, Polish young people when we have common project. Uh, so really they dealt with them like on easy way. We are so stressed and everywhere and the volunteers from Czech Republic were great with the young people and teach them, ta taught them everything and <laughs> editing. And uh, the second, I have a question for Rebecca. Number two, <laughs> first of all, uh, ovation that you came here really after all everything. <laughs> yeah, we are we are uh, tracking you on the Telegram, and uh, second, um, th there was a, I will uh, check your presentation later, but there was a, a survey about uh, that there are, um, most uh, most of young people. Uh, like 87% uh, are willing to contribute and most of them are young people. So um, the same question, how, how young? And uh, how did you check it? It was like a poll or in, uh, in, in uh, how, how many 
Uh, people, uh, have you asked? Uh, yeah. I'll be happy to answer that. <laughs> Actually, the fact that I was too quick, I did maybe mention the, the issue. Actually, we had, we, in, in Rwanda, we implemented movement strategy implementation grant, you know that? So we carried out a research in East Africa. Rwanda, Burundi, and Tanzania. Ah, no, Rwanda, Burundi, and Congo. So through that research, it was about skills development, needs assessment. You get it? Uh, yes. So um, those are where the statistics we got from the research. Um, there, there was 87 uh, percent of 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 young people from 14 years old to 60 old. I I I, I mentioned it maybe to 60, but a bigger number is between 14 to 30. But the overall statistics, we, 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 I don't know how. I can mention it maybe, but it, it, it is like that. That was the facts from the statistics we carried out in, in, in our community, in our local communities. So another question? Maybe I forgot something you mentioned the last. Thank you. Oh, well, you are satisfied. Yeah, I will, I will check the <laughs> yeah, and I can share the link because the, 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 the research findings are shared on Wikimedia Commons. And I have uh, a, a, a piece of copy there. You can see on that on the desk there. Uh, that one. One minute. Okay. You see, uh, it is at uh, is more. Uh, this is one of the copy we wrote. Wikimedia Communities Movement Strategy 2030 in Africa Great Lakes: Skills Development and Community Engagement. So. So you can find all this on Wikimedia Commons. Uh, all the findings and the statistics. Or personally, I can share with you the whatever you want to, to learn about that. Yeah. So, but we have we are now having facts of uh, what are the challenges in our community, what are the opportunities, what are the people like you have a big mailing list of the people because we could ask a question in our in our survey uh, brochures that are you really willing to join Wiki, Wikipedia, Wikimedia Foundation? Are you willing to contribute on Wikipedia? 90% um, they say yes. What is the challenge? I don't know what it is. What is the challenge? I don't have internet. What is the challenge? I am a girl. I can't use a computer. You know, those, those, those such uh, challenges. So we have a lot of facts uh, from needs assessment in our local communities. Thank you. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. I have a question also for Lucy, for senior citizens. Um, how do you contact them to reach to your workshops? In, in what means? Thank you for that. It's actually a really good question. Does it work? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we, we observed a little bit how it works and we did quite some iterations, I would say, last two years. And one thing which works very well is the banner. So we actually have a banner every January. We have a fundraising campaign for the senior program in, in December. And so we fundraise. We usually have some video and, and, and we talk about the program and its impact. And then at the same time, we open the good number of courses from January, and, and that as well comes with banner at the Wikipedia. So the banner has a really good result. And then we as well cooperate with a few of the NGOs who focus on working with elder people. Uh, we as well have this framework of univers universities of third age. So our universities has a program for elder people as well. So some of them as well pair up with us. And then we have a newsletter and what we did with last year's is, this is the first time engagement for the beginners, then often this requires my colleague coordinator to call them in the later stages when we were through the COVID and through the online courses, we have to make sure that we have the like zero lesson where they can drop in and get oriented within the online environment to see whether they manage. And we try to encourage them to do it and to support them at the beginning so they don't drop out. 
And then what we do later is we as well offer like extensions. So we have this, this common courses now, and then we have as well something from last year started, which we call Wiki Schola, Wiki School. It comes, it's a different one from the Polish one though. It comes every month as a, as a two hours online session and it's on specific topics. So those who took the basic courses and they want to continue, so that would be like a session on how to create infobox or session how to put basic Wikidata into your article or how to upload a picture which you are not author of. So tiny little topics to keep them engaged through the year. Um, you told that you are using Wikipedia banners like to gain attention of the seniors, but the issue is that um, generally signing up on Wikipedia and starting interacting with Wikipedia is kind of difficult. I wonder like how you manage to ask these people to join and contribute or telling that they are willing to be part of this program. I don't know, but the traffic at Wikipedia happens. Like everybody ends up at Wikipedia <laughs> and I think we just use it. And I think it works as well generationally that maybe some, uh, some adult people, like average age uh, people, like most of us here, I guess, don't offense anybody, they just see it and then they maybe tell their grandparents, like, look, maybe you want to join the course. But I, I, I don't really, I honestly don't know how it works. <laughs> But it works. <laughs> just because of maybe and I, I encourage you, you to a try phone it. number or something that if you're interested, just make a call, then we will continue on the phone or something like that. But no. if it is happening through the Wikipedia, that would be very much interesting. Yeah, we have a site, we have like a page which is dedicated to the senior courses, and there is a list of uh, courses which are just open, and they can sign up usually through Google Form. This is it. But we have to collect their personal data through the Google form, definitely, and then we get in touch with them. So that, 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 like, that's the individual part. But first, they have to register themselves. That's the first step. Interesting. Anyone else? So let's clap. It seems that's over. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> uh, so um, this session is over, but we will have uh, the final session, Don't Go Anywhere, uh, in five minutes right here. So um, you can take a walk or, or be here, whatever you like.
Those of you who are lingering, I have already asked you to come into the room. Okay, Zico, please get us started. I cannot. Oh. It works. A little bit too much. Yes, something like this. This okay? Like this. Okay. Could could you please shout again? Because I, I don't dare to shout here. In, Everyone sit so. down. <laughs> I do it all with my eyes. I, I could call up names, people who are standing still there, but I only do that at schools. Okay, I start. Ladies, gentlemen, diverse people, welcome to the end of the second day. And yes, there's only one, one day left and we should cherish this moment with a little reminder. I want you all always to remember whatever people say. You, everybody who is here, you are not Wiki Average. You are Wiki Median. And that's a, quite a difference. I mean it. Uh, again, we have this system in order to generate some positive vibes collectively, and I would ask you to go on with the slides. Please use your smartphone. This is something I don't say lightly. Find the link and then use that code. It's a nice music Liana chose. Nice. I believe you chose this, Zico. I don't dare looking at her. <laughs> okay, what, what do you think? Raise your hand if you need more time. Okay. Five. Four. Three. Two, one. You can always join later. The uh, link will still be there. But we're going to start. Yes. So again, for starters, just to test the software and also you, uh -oh. we have a little question. Which program item saw the most participants today? What do you think? Hmm. I hope it's not too difficult. I will extend the time on this one. Yes. Or I cannot extend the time it's, on this one. It's, it's decent. I don't know decent. Okay, we agree. It's, it's a quite, for, for this group of people, it's quite good uh, response. Thank you. And the next slide, please is about a very serious topic. On the one hand, I must say you are the best audience I ever saw. You always listen to the presenter. You never have a screen in front of you, no laptop, no smartphone. But the downside is we are hardly visible on social media. So I wonder what's the reason for that? And I simply think you still need some suggestions what to post on social media. So um, could you please do the next quiz question with some ideas that you can post on social media? We do everything together. There's no I in Wikipedia. A Wikipedia article about you. The costs will surprise you. 
Thanks to Wikipedia, I have friends in all parts of the world, but none in my neighborhood, and the local conference team is great, of course. They're all wrong answers. All wrong answers. I remember that I remind you that this is very new software for everybody, <laughs> including us. Okay, see, I, I see that the test is, it's a decent, decent uh, quote, thank you. And please, the next slide. Yeah, this is again about the tomorrow world, and I always find it very hard, you know, predictions, they are so difficult to make, especially when they are about the future. And therefore, we have asked external help, which is on his way, or... We hope. Cornelius, may, are you here? Not. Okay. Well, or we'll later we'll have the occasion yes, to... Yes, perhaps Cornelius can do a summation of what he got out of the sessions um, tomorrow in the closing tomorrow. session. Tomorrow, yes. <coughs> Should we take the person for today for... You mean you could enjoy the presenter of tomorrow today. That would also be future times. Is Ben here? Do you want to come do a little quick, I'm pulling Ben away from a conversation since he is not in the room right now. <laughs> ben, why don't you come up and give a quick overview of what your session is tomorrow and why people should come. Yes. Okay. Don't feel as a replacement, it's just a different time. Well, that was awkward. I'm so sorry about that. Um, a little tired, jet lag right now. Uh, so tomorrow, we have the last of the Belgrade Room uh, strategic sessions, just one. This one won't be repeated, uh, and it's just an hour. And knowing that we were given the last slot at the conference when everyone will be tired, maybe a little talked out and things like that, we are going to do something that feels a bit more like a, almost like a theater exercise on our feet, uh, where we will kind of think through a lot of possible future scenarios and see uh, what we what we agree with and what we disagree with, and we'll sort of arrange ourselves spatially to see where that agreement falls, where that disagreement falls, and so and then start to talk, have some discussion on our feet about what that means. Uh, like why why did you why did you stand here rather than there, and see where the agreement is feeling easy, and where we're seeing some different perspectives. So hopefully we'll learn a lot about the variety of points of view in this community, but with an eye toward reconciling them into a common agenda. So it's very much building on the themes that we've, that the other workshops have done, but it's taking a bit more of a playful uh, approach, you know, at the end of the conference to see, and I think with a particular emphasis on technological change and the things that are gonna make, you know, our evolution challenging in the way that the media and technology landscape is evolving. So I hope that makes some sense. If that arouses your curiosity, good. Come and you will see what this is like. Like, and uh, we'll have a lot of talking and moving, and it'll be good. And I'll be co-facilitating with uh, my colleague, Yope, who is maybe not in the room right now. So that's it. I hope you'll join us. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And we go on with our little slides. And again, it's about your great session tomorrow. Uh, as you see, there are not so many left uh, on Sunday, but still I would like to have the Wheel of Fortune going and uh, ask the lucky winner of this contest, please come here and tell us first what your session is about and second, why is it great? Liana. Oh, luckily it's not mine. Learning tool at universities. Who is the lucky winner who wants to tell what's going to happen tomorrow? This is Nuria. Is she here? Yeah. Come on up. So we, we don't uh, force anybody. So if you want to recline, then, then we... Yeah? <laughs> what is it about and why is it great? Uh, why is it great? I'm not sure. I mean, I'm sure. So, okay. Uh, wow. <laughs> uh, so tomorrow I'm gonna talk about um, using Wikipedia as a learning tool in university. I'm an adjunct in uh, Barcelona, and um, I mainly work with um, 
Asian art, so that means uh, working with um, a field that is uh, full of holes in the Catalan Wikipedia, which is our uh, main domain. We used also, or we uh, mess around with also the Spanish Wikipedia. But uh, yeah, I, I want to talk about engagement, and uh, which is all unknown by everybody here, maybe that it's it's pretty low after the uh, compulsory work is done. So um, it's, I, I wanted just to share some thoughts about it and you know uh, maybe some uh, other point of view on this session. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's a lot. Do you want a second shot? Yes. Or if, should I use the other If microphone? we roll it again, it's either going to be mine or yours, Zico. This one, yeah. Uh, so I am curious. Oh. Ah. <laughs> Again, unless you have. I will to remove add the entry for the next spin, so we don't do that again. <laughs> Artificial intelligence in the classroom and. Uh, I don't know what to say, I, I know the situation, so tomorrow I'm going to have a session about some background to think about artificial intelligence, how a wiki works, what are the elements of a wiki, uh, other processes, how does a writing process work, and in that you can think about collaborative writing, but also at what point artificial intelligence could make a difference. So welcome to my great presentation tomorrow. Should we give it a last try for... Well, it actually landed on mine, but... <laughs> so, a third one. <laughs> so, I will, I will talk about the dashboard tips and oh, tricks. Yes. Um, so, the, the dashboard tips and tricks session is when I am co-facilitating with Amanda, um, who is here. Um, and so, we are going to do a deep dive on the programs and events dashboard. I know it's a tool many of you use. I bet I will teach you something you didn't know about it. So if you, even, even advanced users, will find interesting and new ways to help, um, help you with your programs with the dashboard. And then Amanda will do a great overview of how she's using it in Brazil and we'll talk more about the context of how she integrates it into her other work that she does with the um, instructor she works with. So uh, I encourage you to come by. Although Zico's great. session and Ben's session and Nuria's session are also at the same time and they will all be great too. So, you know, take, you can't lose. There, there's you know all good sessions. You know which one is the greatest, so, yes? Thank you. And no, 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 no. Back, 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 back. That was for tomorrow. Uh, one last uh, admonishment because of uh, unpleasant events in the past. I must admonish you that also today, tonight in the restaurant, the universal code of conduct will be in force. This means you are not supposed to uh, correct typos on the menu card and you are not supposed to go in discussion with the waiter why calamari are mentioned under fish. <laughs> we had a little um, problem to find a suitable restaurant. The local team informed me so there was a restaurant that said so we have um, at 7 o'clock there will be a warm buffet, at 7.30 there will be a tepid or lukewarm buffet, and at 8 o'clock there will be a cold buffet and we, we didn't take that restaurant so we found something awesome and I suppose that Philip is now here with some information. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, housekeeping um, stuff about to today's tour. Just to remind everyone about everything <laughs> relevant to that. So, we start at six in front of the hotel, so please be punctual. The buses cannot wait too much, too long. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think you'll have enough time. We're finishing up soon, right? So we'll, you'll have an hour to go to your hotel if you don't stay here, um, to refreshen up, to maybe change, and then come back here. Um, do bring an umbrella if you have one, <laughs> because we do expect some rain. Um, it has been a nice day throughout, but 
than the forecast says 94% of rain, so um, <laughs> I'm, I'm inclined to believe it. Um, then again, it should have rained like two hours ago, but then. Um, anyway, um, the plan is we're going to board the buses, two buses, either one is good, but don't all go to the same one. Um, and we're going to drive around town. There's going to be a guide who's going to tell you a bit about history of Belgrade and about the landmarks that you'll see or might not be able to see because of the protests. So please be aware of that. We're sorry about that, but then it wasn't planned by us. You can join them, of course. Um, you're, I wouldn't say welcome to, but if you want to, we won't stop you. No, it's not a part of the city tour. <laughs> It is not part of the city tour. Um, the buses will leave us around somewhere near Kalemegdan Fortress, which is the fortress in Belgrade, the only one. Um, and you will be able to follow the guided tour. We have a great guide who's done a lot of tours before for us, uh, especially for Kalemegdan, which is a, a place with rich history. Um, and um, you will walk around Kalemegdan. It might be slippery because of the uh, rain, or it might not be, who knows, but be ready to wear non-slippers. <laughs> so the, the shoes that are comfortable and made for walking. Um, yeah, and then 8.30 we'll, be, we'll arrive at the uh, restaurant called Trisheshira. So if you do not want to be a part of the tour, no one's forcing you, you can go directly to the restaurant, which is, again, optional, no one's forcing you. Uh, but we would like to see you there. Um, yeah, the dinner ends at 11.30 and we will guide you to the buses. They will wait, all right, 11.10, 11.15, 20, around that time because it will take us a, a few minutes to reach the buses, which will be waiting for us and would not be able to wait too long because it's the city center. So. On that note, if you do not wish to wait for the bus, or if you want to stay longer in the city, you're by no means obliged to take the bus. You can take a taxi or a bus or some, a public bus or anything else to reach, or you can walk here, why not? It's an hour and a half. Um, <laughs> good sobering experience. Um, <laughs> so, um, but yes, our organized buses will leave at 11.30 from the spot that we will show you. So, please, Enjoy yourself. <laughs> you did not expect that. Um, yeah. And just a, a small update, no, not an update, but information. Tomorrow program starts at 9.30, a bit later than today. So we'll have more time to rest, to sleep, to be productive for Ben and Liana's and Ziku sessions. So, and the closing. So yeah, I think that's it for me. Um, if you have any questions, I'm here. If not, then. That's it for me. Yes. Wait, you have a question? No? Sorry, I have a very technical question. We can sleep longer, but the breakfast is till nine still, or till nine thirty then? Till ten. Thank you. And I have two questions. Is it possible to take uh, the bus from the restaurant a little bit earlier, or not? We have to take till the midnight almost, we have to wait. <laughs> um, yeah, so the question was whether it's possible to take a bus earlier. The answer is no, <laughs> sadly, uh, because this has been pre-organized. Um, so changing the schedule is not possible at this time. So 11.30 is the time. <laughs> we can help you out if you want to get back sooner with directions and buses and taxis. All right. Oh. There's some thunder out there. Hopefully that thunder resolves before we all get on the bus. <laughs> all right. Okay, thank you everyone. We will see you on the buses. In an hour.